My, um, we'd like to welcome you all to our fifth biennial Meet the Candidates Forum. My name is Bill Bittenbender. I'm the president of the Alliance of Brunswick County Property Owners Associations who is sponsoring this event. Before beginning, I'd like to take a moment to remember one of our Alliance members who was a driving force uh, for these candidate forums for the past 10 years. Uh, Gordon Ackley of Lockwood Folly passed away last week and we will miss his enthusiastic support of this event. Our thoughts and prayers are with his family during these uh, trying times. We have a number of co-sponsors to this event, the Brunswick Beacon, the State Port Pilot, WECT Fox News, the Atlantic Membership Telephone Corporation, Brunswick County, North Brunswick and South Port, Oak Island Chambers of Commerce, and Brunswick Community College. We sincerely appreciate all their support. I'd like to take just a second to tell you a little bit about the Alliance. We are an organization of 16 property owners associations in Brunswick County, representing over 14,000 property owners. Our goal is to work with county and state um, officials to promote organized growth and that protects property values, enhances the safety, health, and quality of life for all Brunswick County residents. We, <clears throat> the Alliance is nonpartisan. We do not uh, endorse or support one candidate or another. We do not endorse or support one political party over the other. And we do not provide funds or engage in fundraising for our political candidates. If anybody has an interest in our organization, uh, we do have a website, and that's shown in the uh, uh, little brochure that was handed to you on the way out. I'm, I'm sorry, on the way in. For some ground rules, I will ask our audience to remain quiet throughout the question and answer period. We want each candidate to have an opportunity to express their views. At the end of the formal question and answer period, there will be an, opp opp an opportunity for about 10 minutes for questions from the audience and you'll come down to these microphones in the front. Each candidate will have time to answer questions, as our moderator will sort of shortly explain. To assure that the program proceeds promptly, uh, each candidate will be alerted by our timer when he or she has 15 seconds remaining, and then alerted that time is up. And that's down in the front row there, and you'll see the yield sign that tells you you have 15 seconds and stop says your time is up. Our timer tonight is Angie Sutton, interim publisher for the Be Brunswick Beacon and president of the Brunswick Board of, uh, Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors. <coughs> All candidates for the, uh, the offices were provided uh, a notice at the, at the same time. Some were able to work that into their schedules, others were not. Congressman McIntyre was unable to be here and has asked that our audience um, now they had another commitment in Washington. A statement from his office has been included in the, each one of the um, handout brochures. I would also like to take this opportunity to at recognize a number of other candidates, though they're not participating in the, uh, in the uh, debate or the uh, question and answer period, uh, but they are here in attendance. Uh, we have Bud Thorson, running for the Board of Education. Catherine Cook, Catherine Cook, running for the Board of Education. Tom Simmons, <coughs> Board of Education. Brenda Clemens, a Register of Deeds. And I think that's it. Now, if I've missed somebody, uh, there are two gentlemen over by the... Uh, what? <laughs> Pat Sykes, I'm very sorry. Blame Gary, he didn't write it down. <laughs> if I've missed anybody, please uh, just let one of the guys know and we'll make sure you're recognized. One comment to our candidates. Our moderator has been asked to keep your answers on point. Therefore, I request that you answer all questions as specifically as possible. The moderator has the latitude to follow up on questions and or comments as he sees fit. Our moderator will pose questions in session one to the candidates on the stage. From my far right are <coughs> Mr. David Rouser, candidate for the 7th Congressional District, 
Scott Phillips, candidate for county commissioner, Michael Ballard, candidate for county commissioner, and Frank Williams, candidate for county commissioner. The moderator for tonight's forum is the well-known and award-winning WBCT Fox TV news anchor John Evans, and who will moderate the discussion and pose questions that have been developed by our membership and our event sponsors. Okay, without further ado, John. Bill, thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for being here and taking the time uh, out of uh, your schedules uh, to become a more educated voter. Um, I always think that anything that could lead to a more educated populace, and specifically a more educated voter, is well worth the while. First off, let me say to Bill and uh, everybody at the ABC POA, thank you for the opportunity to do this. Uh, I learn as much as I hope you all do uh, from this event. Candidates, thank you for taking the time and making the time tonight to be here with us. Uh, we hope that your answers this evening will uh, let these folks know where you stand on several issues. Uh, you will have two minutes for an opening statement, uh, 60 seconds to answer the question, uh, two minutes for a closing statement. Again, you saw the uh, yield sign uh, and the stop sign. I think most of you have been to uh, events that I have done. I'm not going to cut you off in mid-sentence, but I'm not going to let you start another thought process either. If we get near that two-minute process, David, you know well, you've been with me for several of these. Uh, and again, uh, I do have the latitude in this one, which is uh, good, to kind of rein you in. If you kind of get off track, I'm going to try to bring you back on point and get these uh, answer, questions answered as best we can. Uh, what we plan on doing is, since I have questions for uh, both the congressional candidate and the commissioner's candidate, uh, I think I will rotate, uh, go with a question for you, Mr. Hauser, first, uh, then to the county commissioners for all three uh, for a question, then I'll start with all three and then go back to you and kind of rotate back and forth if that works for both of, all four of you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you will have your time at the uh, microphones, so we please, we ask you to kind of keep uh, any kind of applause down, uh, any kind of shouting, jeering, that just takes away from the time that these gentlemen have to give you their answers, okay? I am going to start uh, with Mr. Rouser uh, first. We're going to give you two minutes for an opening statement. Ladies and gentlemen, David Rouser, candidate for the 7th District House of Representatives. Mr. Rouser. Well, thank you very much, John. I appreciate uh, the Alliance of Brunswick County Property Owners Association for hosting uh, this forum, and I hope that this will be very informative for you. I'm running for Congress because this election, I believe, and I believe many that I run, run across along the campaign trail believe this as well, is the most critical election in our lifetimes. I believe this election is going to determine what kind of country we have. We have a $16 trillion debt that's going to increase to $32 trillion and $64 trillion before we know it. We have got to move this country in a very, very different direction. My entire career, I have focused on bringing solutions to very complex problems. My time working on Capitol Hill, my time serving in the executive branch, my time working in the private sector, and also my time serving in the state senate the past four years. In the state senate, I focused on getting rid of the onerous rules and regulations that are making it difficult to do business for our small businesses and our family farmers in particular. I have focused on cutting spending. We must cut spending at the federal level if we're going to get this debt under control. We've got to grow the economy and we've got to cut spending if we're going to tackle our national debt. Now there's some other issues that are very important as well for this area. Beach renourishment, inlet dredging, we need to have a designated source of funding long term to take care of those issues. And I believe we need to have a state federal partnership that's focused exactly on that so that we don't have to worry year after year whether we're gonna have the money to take care of those things. The National Flood Insurance Program is incredibly important to this area. And all these issues I have dealt with for a long time from my experience working on Capitol Hill and also in the North Carolina Senate. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today and I look forward to the questions. Mr. Rouser, thank you. Now we will go to the three candidates running for county commission here in Brunswick County. Uh, for the opening statements, we will go in uh, alphabetical order. Uh, so for his opening statement, let's uh, go to Mr. Michael Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Thank you, Mr. Evans, and thank the ABC POA for inviting me to be a part of this forum. 
My name is Michael Ballard. I'm a lifelong resident of Brunson County. I live in the Phoenix community, which is a part of the Vassal city limits. I served on the board for 10 years from 2001 to 2011, served as the mayor pro tem for two years. Brunson County is my heart and soul. We have great opportunity now to move forward. We have a great opportunity to make a difference. We know that we are dealing with high unemployment. We know that we're dealing with a high poverty rate. We know that we are still dealing with folk that are living in substandard homes. And this time now that we move forward and look how we can reach out to take care of our citizens without increasing taxes, without going way out there to try to reach beyond our needs and yet work with what we have within our county. It's a struggle, and yes, it's gonna be a hard struggle, but at the same time, we can make the change if we all put our hearts and minds together. Thank you. Next for his opening statement, we're going to go to Brunswick County Commission candidate, Scott Phillips. Mr. Phillips. Thank you, Mr. John, Mr. Bill, and the ABCPOA for this opportunity to meet the citizens of Brunswick County. I was born and raised here in, in Southport, North Carolina. And I moved to Winnebo uh, after I graduated from our Brunswick County school system. I married my high school sweetheart. We have three children. Four years ago, I ran for this office for the same reason I'm running today. And that's for those three children and for your children and the future generations. How do we attack? the issues that we face today. I think everybody will agree that economic development in Brunswick County is something that we all need. There is, as Mr. Ballard said, a high unemployment rate. So how do I plan to do that? With my other two issues, education. We need to make sure that our children have the finest education that we can possibly give them. Through that education, they can qualify and be committed to getting high paid, high quality jobs. We need to bring those jobs to Brunswick County. We need to support our small businesses. We need to support our local industry. And we need to market Brunswick County to the rest of the United States to bring those high paying, high quality jobs to our area. And finally, the taxes. As a commissioner for the last four years, up until 2011 when we did a reevaluation, we maintain a 30.5% tax rate, fourth lowest in the state of North Carolina. The board that we have right now, and I hope the future board, is committed to maintaining the tax rate that we have. How do we do that? We've made some tough decisions in the last four years, and I intend on making the tough decisions in the next four. We've maintained our capital improvement. We've cut capital improvement in order to maintain our tax rate. We've had to make tough decisions with our employees. Okay. Mr. Phillips, thank you, sir. Uh, we will go to uh, an opening statement from another candidate for Brunswick County Commission, Mr. Frank Williams. Mr. Williams. Thank you, John. And thank you to the Alliance of Brunswick County Property Owners Associations, as well as all the co-sponsors for, for hosting this. I think exercises like this are important exercises in our democracy. John, I'd like to thank you for making the trip across the bridge to get here, and I hope it didn't take you three hours to get across the causeway like it did me the other day. And I'd like to thank all of you in the audience for being here. Um, being a citizen in a free society is not a spectator sport. And there are lots of other things you could be doing tonight, but you made the time to come here. And regardless of whether you vote for myself or Mr. Ballard, I just appreciate you being here. And Mr. Ballard, I'd like to thank you for your willingness to serve. One thing that I do want to point out about our system here is that Mr. Ballard and I are running for one seat, and Scott is running for a different seat. So that's something, when you look at your ballot, there are several different county commission races you need to look at. I'm running because I love this county. It's, I think it's the greatest place on this planet to live. And with the growth that we've had in the past 10 years, we're going to have to make smart decisions moving forward to keep it that way. Some of those, we've got to keep your taxes as low as possible so that you can continue to afford to live in this county. We've got to be a business-friendly county so that those people who need jobs can either start businesses or people can, can start businesses and hire the people who need jobs. And we've got to make sure we spend every dime of your taxpayer money wisely and spend it on whatever the top priorities are. Education is certainly one. Public safety is certainly one. But we've got to make sure that we don't waste a dime of your taxpayer money on something that, should, that shouldn't be spent on when there are top priorities that aren't funded. 
And I do respectfully ask for your vote. I'm Frank Williams, and I look forward to serving you and answering your questions. Gentlemen, thank you. We are going to move to the question and answer position, uh, part of our program tonight. Uh, 60 seconds now for the responses, if I can. Uh, and we are going to start with the uh, commission candidates. And this question specifically is more for the uh, non-incumbents. So, Mr. Phillips, I'll ask you a little version of the question after I get to Mr. Ballard and Mr. Williams. Mr. Ballard, I'm going to ask you this question first, sir, if I may. Uh, to help the audience assess your readiness to assume this important position, in terms of knowing the duties and the responsibilities and the issues. Uh, could you tell the audience what percentage of the commissioner meetings you've attended as a citizen in the past year? And additionally, what did you learn? Actually, in the past year, I have not attended any of the commissioners meeting. Prior to that, I was serving as the town council for the town of Nevada. But at the same time, I am aware of as to what was taking place within the county. I made sure I stayed up with the local news media and the newspaper to find out as to what was being done and what was not being done. And also, I am willing to put the best foot forward to make sure that if elected as county commissioner that I would be there and give you the same effort and the same 100% that I gave to the town of Nevada as one of the elected officials. Thank you, sir. Mr. Williams, uh, to help the audience assess your readiness to assume this important position in terms of uh, duties, responsibilities, and issues, please tell the audience what percentage of the commissioner meetings you've attended as a citizen in the past year, and what did you learn? Thank you, John. I probably attended 75 to 80 percent of the meetings. I attended yesterday the meeting and the workshop that they had. I attended part of the budget workshop. And probably the biggest thing that I learned is how much I still have to learn. There is a lot to learn about being a county commissioner. I think Scott would tell you this as an incumbent, that when you come into this, you probably think you know a lot more than you actually do. And that's one thing I think you need to know about me is I don't proclaim to have all the answers. What I do have is a philosophy of solving problems that I believe I've shown, have learned even more through this process how important that is. And another event that I attended today was a transportation workshop the sheriff hosted. And I think it's important to get out and attend as many things like that as we can to learn every issue that impacts the citizens. Uh, Mr. Phillips, obviously, uh, you didn't attend as a citizen, but I'd like to uh, uh, get from you uh, what you have learned in the first four years of being a commissioner in Brunswick County. I will say it has been a, a learning experience. And one thing that I've tried to do when I sat in the meetings like Mr. William and Mr. Ballard have prior to being a commissioner, this county spends a lot of money in needed areas. But I was not aware, sitting in the, in the audience with an agenda in hand, exactly why that money was spent. So one thing I do try to do is, during the course of a meeting, I will ask questions, though I may know the answer, just to get the word out to the people. Because I think it's important that you understand a lot of the questions that I get, why are we spending money here, why are we spending money there, they don't understand why the money was spent, so they just need an explanation. And learning to explain to the citizens to have them better informed has been a great benefit. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rouser, we're going to go over to you for the question. Uh, Mr. Phillips talked about spending, so I'm going to ask you a question about spending at the congressional level. The federal deficit, more than $16 trillion, growing every day. Would you support a balanced legislation to rein in spending and increase revenues in an effort to lower the deficit? I certainly would support a balanced budget amendment to the U.S. Constitution. And the way, you, and the way we're going to get out of this is we have to do two things. We have to grow the economy. When you grow the economy, guess what? You have more revenue coming into the U.S. Treasury. How do you grow the economy? You get the federal government out of the way. Uh, you reform the tax code so that it's fair to everyone and lower the rates. You get rid of the onerous rules and regulations that make it difficult to do business. And you have to focus on, on cutting spending. And so all, all of those things we have to do if we're going to tackle this debt head on. Second part to that question, sir, and you, again, you have another full minute to talk about this. Brunswick County basically sits in between two of the largest military bases, not just in North Carolina, but the world in Fort Bragg and Camp Lejeune. So I ask you, what about defense spending when it comes to the budget? Well, we need to protect our uh, soldiers in uniform every step of the way. They need to be fully funded and have, and have all the resources available to them uh, to perform the job. And then along those lines, we also need to be taking care of our veterans. 
We do a poor job of taking care of our veterans in this country. It is absolutely horrific, uh, the stories that I hear day after day, just as a state senator from folks who are in my state senate district, not to mention all the folks that I've run into in this neck of the woods. We've got to, we've got to protect and take care of our men and, women, men and women in uniform. You know, it's very instructive, I think, in the very first appropriations bill the U.S. Congress ever, ever passed, one-third of the budget was for disabled veterans. We need to have a focus and focus on the priorities, and our, our men and women in uniform and our veterans need to be a priority, and then we need to uh, allocate money elsewhere as we have it available. But those, those two, our men and women in uniform and our veterans, definitely need to be a priority. Thank you, sir. Back to the county commissioners, and uh, Commissioner Phillips, this question specifically for you to lead off, sir. Uh, you supported a property tax reduction for residents who've lived in Brunswick County for the past 25 years. Without an offset in expenditures, this would mean the rest of the population would pay more. Why do you think anyone who has lived here for less than 25 years should give you their vote? Part of that resolution to support that tax uh, exemption for those that have lived here 25 years, also there was an age I think it was also 70 years of age. And there are two people, two, two groups that I will fight for as a county commissioner. One is our children and one is our senior citizens. Without them, we wouldn't be here today. And those folks that have been here uh, pretty much lifelong residents and have supported this county and seen its growth, I feel like they should get a, a discount or a break whenever possible. Some of those that have been here long enough will remember that when Brunswick County got into the water business, it was your ad valorem taxes that did it. A lot of those folks that we voted for are now receiving a benefit from that. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Williams, I'm going to ask for your response. Uh, did you favor the uh, vote for the property tax reduction for residents who have lived in the county for the past 25 years, or as Mr. Phillips said, 70 years old? And uh, why do you think anyone who has lived here for less than uh, 25 years should give you their vote? Well, I, th I see two questions there. And there one, first, as far as the tax reduction, I do see the importance of that because there are, are, especially up in the area where Mr. Ballard and I live, a lot of people who are on fixed incomes, who are, there's a high poverty level in that area. And what we don't need to have happen is for our growth to become something that punishes some of the people who have been here for, their, for multiple generations. So that's a challenge there. As far as why people who ha have or have moved here in the last 20 years. I did grow up here. I am a native, but I also did live away for a while. I lived in Raleigh, so I've seen the ways other places do things. I know the reasons many of you moved here, and I want to help Brunswick County continue to be the place you chose to move to. You came here for a reason, and some of you came here to get away from something. I've heard that from a few of you. We've got to continue to be the place that you chose to move to, and that's why I want to be a commissioner is to help fight for that. Uh, Mr. Ballard, the uh, uh, property tax reduction vote uh, for those who have lived here for the past 25 years and 70 years of age, do you approve of that? And secondly, do you think anyone, why do you think anyone who has lived here for less than 25 years should give you their vote? Yes, Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Evan, I do approve of that because as Mr. Williams said, in the area I live in, 90% of our residents are 65 and older. And I have seen the benefit that they receive from the tax reduction being on a fixed income. They were able to make ends meet that normally would not have been able to make ends meet. And for those who have been here 25 years or less, even at some point in time, we will grow to that same stage also that we will be able to benefit from the tax reduction. And so I'm asking for your vote because I think that is something that we should keep in place and that we should never get rid of because we have to make sure that our seniors are taken care of. Thank you, sir. Uh, second uh, question for the commission candidates. Mr. Williams, I'm going to ask for your response first, sir. The Brunswick County budget is approaching $200 million. Capital expenditures are the subject of a three-year budget. But the largest piece of the budget, operation and maintenance, is only budgeted and projected on an annual basis. Question. In view of the size of the enterprise, do you think it's time to take a longer look like a three- to five-year projection to preclude making any myopic decisions? Absolutely. I'm a big believer in strategic planning and long-term planning in everything that I do. Uh, my clients will tell you that in my business, that's the way I help them, is help them make long-term plans. 
And I think if, if you can put this year's expenditures and next year's expenditures in the context of a much bigger vision, then you're going to make more intelligent long-term decisions. So I do think the county has grown to that point. We're not the small county we were 20 years ago, and I think that's something we certainly need to put in place in that area and throughout government as much as possible. Mr. Ballard, your response to the question, sir, with the budget approaching $200 million a year, do you think it's time to take a longer look at creating a three- to five-year projection for budget operation and maintenance to preclude making any myopic decisions? Yes, I do. I, be, I think that we need to really take the time to go back and really plan as to how we're going to move forward. And if it take a three- to five-year projection to do that, we need to make sure that all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed because whatever decision that we make as county commissioners is going to affect the whole entire county. And so I say it's best for us to be prepared for the long run than to look at this thing short-sighted. And when we begin to prepare for the future, then we're able to accept the growth as it comes and know where we are going to go and where we are heading. Thank you, sir. Mr. Phillips, I ask for your response to the same question, sir, about a three- to five-year projection for budget operation and maintenance when it comes to capital expenditures. Actually, John, we have uh, a several different capital improvement plans. We look out at 5, 10, and 15 years. But the important thing to understand, the capital improvement projects are something that you can push off for a couple of years here and there. The issue that we've been facing is how do we maintain where we are now and provide the services to the citizens for their quality of life that we enjoy in Brunswick County. So we do uh, look out. Uh, several years. It is a practice that needs to be in place. There has to be planning, but understand also no decision is made until the year that we know where we stand as far as the tax uh, income, the ad valorem income is, and we make decisions based on that. And so far in the last four years, we've controlled our tax rate by doing so. Mr. Phillips, thank you. Mr. Rouser, we're going to go back to you for two questions, sir. The first one being, what is your vision for the future of Social Security? Well, we must preserve and protect Social Security for the long term. Uh, the more immediate uh, crisis is Medicare. Medicare goes bankrupt in 12 years. But specifically regarding uh, Social Security, uh, we need to make sure that our commitment to our seniors uh, stays in place. And I do not uh, recollect exactly when Social Security runs out of money. Um, I know Medicare goes bankrupt before Social Security does. But the fact of the matter is uh, we need to tackle both of these problems head on and, and put forward solutions and have a dialogue with the American people about how we want to proceed on both. Uh, without question, all the money that uh, has been put into Social Security by individuals such as my parents, uh, including myself and, and all those in, in the working community, they need to they need to have Social Security. Uh, that commitment needs to be kept. And so I will do everything possible to make sure that we protect and preserve Social Security for the long term. I want to, I want to play off that. Excuse me, sir. I want to play off that a little bit because there are several different kind of plans out there. And in past forms, you have discussed favoring some versus the others or parts of some. Can you let the audience know a little bit now what you favor, such as uh, the different budgeting plans that might save Social Security or keep Social Security solvent? Well, we haven't uh, discussed Social Security in any public forum that I'm aware of. Most of the focus has been on has been on uh, Medicare and how you how you solve and and uh, protect and preserve Medicare for the future. Uh, but obviously, Social Security is is a, is a system where you, uh, workers are paying in currently, and that money that's being paid in is going to beneficiaries. We have a lot more seniors, a lot of baby boomers that are retiring, and we have fewer workers. And so long term, the program needs to be adjusted. Uh, otherwise, taxes are going to increase dramatically or benefits are going to be, be reduced dramatically. And that's a discussion, uh, you know, that uh, uh, political leaders need to have with the American people. We have a very straightforward dialogue uh, so that we can preserve and protect the program long term. Thank you, sir. Now, the second question uh, to you has to do with a, uh, a recent congressional budget office analysis that estimates the first uh, stimulus package, AARRA, if you will, will cost uh, $814 billion. Unemployment in North Carolina, though, and many counties right here in the 7th Congressional District still is over double digits. Question, would you vote for a second stimulus package if it came to a vote in the United States House of Representatives? No, I would not. Uh, and there's a fundamental principle uh, that I, all of my votes would be cast based on, and that is 
Less government spending and lower taxes create jobs, not more government spending. The more you take from the private sector, the more you take in, in terms of dollars, in terms of taxes from individuals, from a family budget or small business budget, family farmers, that's one less dollar that they have to reinvest in their business. It's one less dollar they have to hire new employees or much less keep the ones that they're trying to keep. So that's, a, that's just a fundamental principle. If we want to grow the economy, let's get the federal government out of the way and let's let our entrepreneurs and individuals who are creating new products and new ideas, let's unleash them and let them do what they do best, and that's create jobs. Thank you, sir. We'll move back to the uh, county commission candidates. Mr. Ballard, I'd like to begin with you for the first response here, sir, if I may. Uh, the last nine to 10 Brunswick County budgets have been uh, unbalanced with respect to projected revenues and expenses. Each year it's been necessary to dip into reserve funds to meet the legal requirement to produce a balance. Question, if elected, under what circumstances would you support using reserve funds to cover current year expenses? If they were an absolute shortage with the money coming into the county, then I could see using reserve as serving as a town council at the town of Nevada, we had an incident where we had to go into reserve funding because we did not receive the accurate amount that was allocated to us for tax revenue, avalor taxes, such that sort. And it should be a one-time thing or a emergency thing only to go into the reserve funding because then you are dipping into actually taxpayers' dollars that is set aside to do something else for the county. So. We have to be very careful and look at that very carefully before you even make that choice to do that. Thank you, sir. Mr. Williams, uh, if elected under what circumstances would you support using reserve funds to cover current year expenditures? Obviously, that's not something you want to get into the habit of doing, but at the same time, this, given the financial situation of the people in this county, I would rather do that on a short-term basis than raise your taxes. I think it's something that, you know, you do it on a case-by-case -case basis, as similar to what Mr. Ballard said, if it's an absolute shortage and an absolute emergency, but you don't want to make a habit of, of using that money to cover recurring expenses. And I think the better solution is to go through every item in the budget, which they've done to a degree already, and find out where, where else can we cut, how can we make things more efficiently, how can we make each department more efficiently, and where can we consolidate things. Mr. Phillips, I ask you, sir, if you're reelected, under what circumstances would you support using reserve funds to cover current year expenditures? Again, John, it's, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. I think Mr. Williams uh, touched on that, as well as Mr. Ballard. Uh, and I have voted to use reserve funds to balance our budget. But I go back to our predecessors, uh, former county commissioners. Several years ago, they put in place a, a county policy of a 20% uh, budget requirement. The state requires 8%. Brunswick County is very financially stable. We have double-A ratings so that when we need to borrow money, we get the best interest rates out there. And we have chosen to uh, allocate reserve funding, yet we haven't spent it all. And we look at that each year. For the first four years that I've been there, um, we have received less and less on our property taxes coming into the, to the county. So that we've had less to work with, so we had to allocate some of the reserve funds, but remember that it is the taxpayer dollar that we're working with. Thank and you, sir. Thank you. Mr. Phillips, I am going to ask you for the first response to the next question. Uh, in August, the county commissioners approved a 2% merit-based raise for county employees for the 2012-2013 fiscal year, amounting to just under $1 million total. Question, given the current economic climate, do you favor or not favor that increase vote? And please elaborate on the reasons for your opinion. I did favor that vote. Uh, I think that vote went four to one. But prior to that, I voted against it four times. The situation that we were in, we did not have year-end uh, totals on what our total budget came in at for 2000 or fiscal year 2011-2012. But we have some good people that work for Brunswick County, and I hope that a lot of y'all see that day in and day out. And I know those of you that are working, no one likes to work without getting rewarded. We made the tough decisions for the last 
three and a half years not to provide the employees a uh, wage increase. We are currently doing a study to determine where we stand and where our employees stand. So I do support it, and I will continue to support it. Thank you, sir. Mr. Williams, given the current economic climate, did you favor the vote to give uh, county employees a merit-based raise and elaborate on your opinion? If I'd been on the commission, I would have voted for that. Um, my reason for that is very simple. As with any organization, any business, you should have as few employees as you need to do your job, but you've got to take care of the ones you have or they're going to leave and go somewhere else. I've dealt with that as a small business owner, and we've got a lot of people who work for the county in lower-level jobs who are making poverty-level wages and slightly above, and we've got to take care of those people or the services that we're required to do by law and the ones that, many, that you pay your taxes for won't be delivered in a proper manner. So I, you know, it's one of those things, if there's a way to, to have done it without the department heads getting it and the higher level executives getting it, I would have favored giving it just to the rank and file employees. And that may be what you did, Scott. I'm not sure on that. Mr. Williams, thank you. Mr. Ballard, did you favor or not favor the vote to give a 2% merit-based raise for county employees and uh, elaborate on the reasons for your opinion? Yes, if I was the county commissioner at that point in time, I would have uh, favor that because I think that taking care of the employees is the most important thing. And we need to find ways to make sure that our employees or the employees are well taken care of because they're out there doing the hard work, they're out there doing the hard labor. Even serving as a town council, as an ambassador, we had to deal with that, whether we had to choose whether we was going to give a merit raise to the employees or we was going to not give it to them. And I thought that they would get their merit pay raise because they deserve it, they work hard, they take the brunt of the blows, and we always should find ways that we could support our employees as they do the job that they were hired to do. Not giving it to the higher end, but make sure that the, the, those that we consider on the low of the end of the totem pole, make sure that they are taken care of. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. Mr. Rouser, let's go back to you for a couple of questions, if we can, sir. Federal unfunded mandates cause a uh, pretty big impact on state and on local governments. Everybody sitting up here is shaking their head. <laughs> What would you do if elected to Congress to try to bring these mandates under control? Well, quite honestly, we need to get rid of them. Serving in the state legislature, any time I was trying to do anything uh, to move the ball forward, whether it, uh -oh, whether it was to, uh, I think a light blew out there. I think you're right. Uh, too much hot air up here, I reckon. <laughs> we'll leave that one alone, Mr. Rouser. You can... Uh, um, <laughs> go ahead, continue. The, uh, the federal government needs to get out of the way of the states and local government. And when I was pushing welfare reform, uh, requiring, and I, I introduced a bill to require welfare recipients to pass a drug test, uh, one of the reasons why that gets stuck in every state legislature is because of the federal government. Uh, there are a number of issues that where the federal government gets in the way. If you're trying to re reform and make <coughs> modifications to Medicaid, uh, you can't do the things you need to do because the, f the federal government has rules and regulations in, in place that prevent you from doing what you need to do. So we need to get the federal government out of the way, delegate those things to the states and, and the local entities, and let them do as they see best for their, uh, for their folks back home. Okay, sir, we're going to ask you one more question, and it has to deal with the Health Care Reform Act of 2011. Um, needless to say, it has caused division among voters in this country. Um, a two-part question, I guess. Do you think the current law, the Health Care Reform Act, is sufficient? If not, what would you offer as an alternative? Well, we need to repeal Obamacare. There's no, absolutely no question about it. Obamacare is one of the biggest drags on the U.S. economy today. There are a number of businesses out there that are trying to figure out their future. They're trying to figure out how they're going to make it uh, under the mandates with Obamacare. In fact, King's Restaurant there in Kinston, North Carolina, many of you probably have passed through there, he's faced with a $120,000 penalty uh, under Obamacare, and he's looking at shutting his doors. That restaurant is an institution in that community. And that's just one example all across this great land. Well, now, what do you do? We have to understand why health care is, is such a problem that it is. It's because of the increased cost. Why are costs increasing so much? You have no transparency and you do not have enough competition. 
Doctor's office is about the only place you go where there is no price list. We have to put in place free market solutions that bring about more transparency and more competition. And, we, and when we do that, that will begin to drive costs down, making health insurance more affordable and accessible to everyone. Thank you, sir. Back to the county commission candidates. Mr. Williams, I'm going to ask for your opinion first. What are your thoughts about future road projects in Brunswick County's northern and southern regions? by way of the ongoing Metropolitan Planning Organization meetings? Well, I have been to a number of the Metropolitan MPO Transportation Advisory Committee meetings. I think the first priority absolutely has to be finishing I-140 all the way around. Secondly, widen the causeway between Leland and Wilmington, and I know they're slated to start that project, I believe, next year or the year after. Beyond that, at some point, we're going to have to replace the Cape Fear Memorial Bridge. I thought that the bridge was old when I was a kid and it's still old, and we're gonna to have to replace that. That's a safety issue. So to me, those are the top three priorities, finishing 140, widening that causeway, and then eventually replacing that bridge. A fourth idea, if I still have time, that the town manager of Leland threw out, that I would like to see him at least investigate, is ex rather than the large Skyway bridge that they've talked about, is extending Martin Luther King Parkway across the Cape, it goes across the Cape Fear, but on across the Brunswick River and into Navassa, and that might help the economy there as well. Mr. Williams, thank you. Mr. Phillips, your thoughts about future road projects for Brunswick County's northern and southern regions by the way of the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization meetings? Yes, sir. I uh, think Frank hit on pretty much the main issues, and the I-140 is something that we've been needing for a long time. Uh, the Skyway Bridge has been spoke about, uh, and, and thankfully right now is a dead issue, but uh, we've had some some pretty good local representatives from Brunswick County that worked very hard to get Highway 140 or I-140 on its way, and we certainly appreciate that. And I think recent events, Mr. Williams alluded to it earlier about the three-hour wait, that the Brunswick County Causeway to New Hanover County is certainly an issue. Uh, we've had a couple incidents the last couple of weeks that had there been a major emergency, we wouldn't have been able to get anyone across the river. So. Those are the major issues, and I'm thankful that we do have representatives that are working hard to get those going for us. Thank you, sir. Mr. Ballard, your thoughts on the uh, future road projects for Brunswick County's northern and southern regions through the ongoing Metropolitan Planning Organization meetings? Yes, Mr. Evans. With me serving on the TAG board for seven years, and was a very strong part of the implementation of the I-140 coming through the Nevada area where it was scheduled to be completed in the year 2020, but we fought and we held our ground so it would be completed in 2016. I favored that the village road project would be full lane throughout the entire Leland area, but that did not fall through because we need to move traffic and the causeway is definitely a traffic headache. And any slight incident that takes place is gonna back traffic up for miles and miles and miles. And so we need to really look at how can we extend our future highway projects to make it beneficial to all the surrounding counties. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Ballard, I'm going to ask you for the first response to the next question, sir. Excessive impact fees like water and sewer connections have been a deterrent to new businesses opening or even current businesses expanding in Brunswick County. Question, how will you assure that these fees are more reasonable so that new businesses can afford to open in Brunswick County? We need to find a way that we could work with business and partner with business that either we can give them a reduction or set them up on a, a plan that they could pay so much up front, pay so much per month for a number for over a period of time. Because if we are not willing to work with them, then they're going to be less apt to come to our area. So we have to find ways that we can accommodate them, not giving them the whole kitchen sink, but yet and still making them feel secure that we as county commissioners will be willing to work with them to make sure that they can operate without being uh, in debt at all times and running a business in a deficit. And so when we begin to work with them and let them know that we have their concern, we want their business, we should be able to uh, partner with them. Thank you, sir. Mr. Phillips, how will you assure that impact fees will be more reasonable so new businesses can afford to open in Brunswick County? As we grow the, the enterprise fund and the projects through wastewater and, and water in Brunswick County, we have uh, continued to look at our fee structure. One thing that we need to be careful of is that we don't end up 
in some of the situations that uh, we see across the river. It does cost money, it's expensive, and, and I, I'm not in favor of the high prices, but I do understand that in order to maintain these structures and facilities and to expand for future growth, that these fees are necessary. But as our uh, system grows, we, are, we should be able to lower those impact fees and make it more attractive for business. We also have a, a wonderful economic development staff, a planning staff that works with current businesses and property owners for uh, rural economic grants. Thank you, sir. Mr. Williams, your thoughts on assuring that fees are more reasonable so new businesses can afford to open in Brunswick County? As Mr. Phillips said, I think as the system grows and we continue to add new businesses and new residences to it, we need to definitely look at the fee structure, see how much we can reduce them. We certainly don't need to be losing money on it, but we also don't need to look at it as a profit center either. It needs to be something where we charge what we have to charge to cover the cost of hooking them up. And if necessary, as Mr. Ballard said, work with them on payment plans um, and other things along those lines. And I think just we could, we could use feedback from the business community on that as to things they've seen in other counties. We're, I'm all ears from, from businesses that have worked with other counties that have, have things that have worked well for them there. Mr. Williams, thank you. Mr. Rouser, back to you for a couple of questions, sir. And you mentioned this earlier um, about losing doctors who will accept Medicare patients. Uh, question, how do you propose uh, the Medicare solvency issue so senior citizens can have access, and specifically access to physicians who continue to accept Medicare? Well, we have to understand why physicians left and right are dropping Medicare patients and refusing to take new Medicare patients is because the reimbursement rate is so little that they can barely keep the lights on. That's the honest truth. You know, and that's how, government, that's how government works. When you have a government program, everything's about the dollar. And if you look at the politics of it, there are far more beneficiaries than there are, there are physicians, so the first folks that they go to cut are the physicians. But you know, that's not helping the beneficiaries. That's not helping anybody who's a senior citizen when you have a need and you try to go and get that need addressed and you can't find a doctor who's willing to take Medicare. Under Obamacare, they took $716 billion out of Medicare to help fund Obamacare. So if we're gonna fix the Medicare issue long term, number one, we don't need to be taking money away from Medicare. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not going to touch one penny from any senior citizen. I'm not going to take one dime from any senior citizen and take away their Medicare at all. Thank Even you, under the Ryan plan. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> uh, I'm going to move on to uh, immigration reform. And again, you have 60 seconds. You can use it in any way that you would like. Uh, do you support comprehensive immigration reform policies such as the law enacted in Arizona? Well, I certainly support the law in Arizona. Arizona is, is uh, unique in that it's a border state, and that is a difficult situation there. When you leave a problem unaddressed for 30 plus years, the criminal element always follows. And the way we're gonna fix this is we're gonna secure the border. I've signed the border security pledge, and I am absolutely committed to securing our border. The other thing we have to do, though, to secure the border is we have to address the demand issue. And the way you do that is you put in place worker visa programs, guest worker programs where workers can come and do the work and then they go home, put in place programs that employers can actually use. And when you do that, guess what? It takes all that pressure off the border and we can focus on those who are here for the wrong reasons and get them out of here and get them out of here fast. Thank you, sir. Back to the county commissioners for at least one more question. Mr. Phillips, I'm going to ask for your response first to this question, sir. Uh, do you agree? Did you vote for the recent decision to combine the Department of Social Services with the Health Department? Yes, I did vote to combine the, into the Human Health Services, and the reason for it is for the people of Brunswick County. I think that a lot of the folks that are served by the Department of Social Services are also being served by the Health Department, and consolidating those two departments will allow for more expedient services to be provided to the citizens. Thank you, sir. Mr. Uh, Williams, did you agree with the recent decision by commissioners to combine the Department of Social Services with the Health Department? I've heard lots of people bending my ear on both sides of this argument, so I know it's a controversial issue. My general principle in, in, in government 
regardless of these two departments or anything else, is consolidate where we can and save money where we can. At this point, you know, given that it's done, I think we need to see if it works and see how it works. I certainly understand some of the arguments against it, but at this point, it's already done, so I think we need to see it, support it and see how far we can take it and make, it, make sure it works as well as possible. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. Did you agree with the recent decision to combine the Department of Social Services with the Health Department? Yes, I do agree with that, and I think it's a very smart move on behalf of the county to bring both departments together where it would be cost effective, it would not be a burden on the taxpayers. That's where you have both services under one umbrella. It'd be easy for the seniors to be able to get around to get the needed service for them. So, uh, as Mr. Williams said, and as Mr. Phillips said, that it has been some controversy about whether it should or should not, but I think it's for the benefit of the county that both partners are joined together. Thank you. Uh, gentlemen, we don't have uh, enough time to give you all one minute to, uh, to fully answer a question, so I'm going to go to the uh, closing statements uh, and letting the audience know that right after the closing statements, we will have uh, the opportunity for you to ask questions. So if you'd like to, uh, it will be uh, seven or eight minutes uh, because each one of these candidates has two minutes for a close. But if you would like to uh, start moving up toward the microphones, uh, we will have about uh, uh, 10 or maybe 15 minutes or so for audience questions. We're going to go to our closing statements. We'll go in reverse order this time. So for his closing statement this evening, we will go with uh, first uh, County Commission candidate, Frank Williams. Mr. Williams. Well, thank you again for all being here, and thank you to all the other candidates up here. How different is this from the debates we've seen on TV in terms of the way we treated each other? I think, you know, I think it's been very cordial, um, I, and I've enjoyed getting to know Mr. Ballard here, and I think that's, you know, local government is important. You know, we, a lot of people pay attention to what happens at the presidential level, but local government affects your day-to-day -day life as much as what happens in Washington, uh, assuming, as David said, that they'll get out of the way and let us do it. And that's one of the reasons that I'm running is because I believe that local government is the front line of, of a free society. I don't come into this planning to make any big promises about what I'm going to give you back with money we took out of your pocket in the first place. I'm here to tell you that I want to make good decisions, do the best job that I possibly can. I don't pretend to have all the answers, and I'm willing to listen to anyone who has thoughts they want to share with me. If you go to my website, which is electfrankwilliams.com, my cell phone number is on there, and you can email me through the form on the, on the contact page, and I will get back with you. And I appreciate your time, and I respectfully ask for your vote. Next for a closing statement, we will go to County Commission candidate, Mr. Scott Phillips. Mr. Phillips, two minutes. Thank you again. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you all for taking time out of your busy day to come down and get to know us a little bit better. My closing statement is fairly simple. Four years ago, I stood before this county seeking an election for the seat of county commissioner. I stand before you today seeking re-election for the same reason and ultimately that is your family and mine. I am committed to this county. I was born and raised here and I plan on retiring and being buried here. And this county means a lot to me and I'm willing to work for it. Four years ago, you didn't know what, my, what I would bring to the table. Now you've got four years of history to look at. You can see where I stand on issues and what I stand for. And I'm asking that you support me for the next four years. Thank you. Mr. Phillips, thank you. Now for uh, his closing statement in this part of our program, County Commission candidate, Mr. Michael Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Once again, thank you, Mr. Evans, and thank you for having us down here. As I said, when I began to run for this position, I'm not running against Mr. Frank Williams. We are both running for County Commissioner. And this campaign is not about me, but it's about you. How can the County Commissioners partner with the municipalities to help bring jobs and create jobs within this county that will work in these municipalities that will create 10 to 15, 25 jobs. But I need your vote. This campaign is not about me, but it's about you. How can the county commissioners work closely with the school board that we can implement or put back in place vocational skills or vocational training in our high schools, such as brick mason, carpentry, auto mechanics, plumbing, things like that, so that when they graduate, at least they'd have an opportunity to start their own business. But I need your vote. This campaign is not about me, but it's about making the welfare for our seniors, our veterans, our homeless, our disabled, our patients that have mental issues. We have to find a way to work with these individuals and provide for these individuals. But I need your vote to do all of that. And I thank you for your support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. And now for two minutes, 
A closing statement by congressional candidate, Mr. David Rouser. Mr. Rouser. Well, thank you, John. I'd like to thank you and everyone who showed up tonight to, uh, to listen to us here at this forum. You know, the election of 2012 is going to be the most critical one of our lifetime. And as I've thought about this and where we're headed as a country, it reminds me of the summer of 1983 when I was working on our family farm there in Johnston County. And I went to check a thermometer reading in a tobacco curing barn. And when I pulled that thermometer out, it was so hot to the touch, I couldn't help but drop it. And I felt bad about that. I was 11 years old. And my uncle came to me and using that as a life lesson, took me down to Mr. Aubrey Austin's there in downtown Four Oaks. And I went in to see Mr. Austin. He was standing right there behind the counter as he usually was. And I told him, I said, Mr. Austin, I have broken this thermometer and I need to buy a new one. And he looked at me and he said, son, he said, don't worry. He said, I'll sell you a new one. And he said, in fact, I won't charge you full price. I'll let you buy it at cost. That's where we are as a country today with this election in 2012. We have an opportunity to get our country back on track at cost. If we don't take this opportunity and move this country back in the right direction, we're going to pass a huge debt to every person coming after us. Future generations are going to be saddled with more and more debt and economic decline that you and I cannot imagine. We'll never be able to get out of it. This is our opportunity to set America back on the right course. Now, I believe in free enterprise. I believe in a limited government. And even more than those two principles, I believe in America. I believe this is the greatest country on earth, and I want to do everything that I can to keep it. I have never promised anyone anything other than my very best effort. We have tremendous problems that we face, and we've got to have solutions and move this country forward in the direction that it deserves to go. Thank you, and may God bless you always. Gentlemen, thank you. We appreciate you taking the time once again. Now, if anybody from the audience uh, would like to step up to the uh, microphones and ask a question, I'm going to give Bill the uh, microphone back uh, to handle this part of our program. Bill? Okay, again, just come up to the uh, front of the auditorium here. <laughs> And uh, please uh, make it a question and not a speech. I mean, we've heard a lot, enough speeches. But I would, as an aside, just like to uh, thank our candidates up here for being uh, very, very respectful of each other's time and the time of our audience. I think really appreciate that. Anyway, we will start off with the right-hand side from, I'm sorry, left-hand side for, for okay, all of you. Okay, my question is for... Uh... My question is for uh, Mr. Rouser. Mr. Rouser, in light of the uh, low approval, approval rating of Congress, what do you plan to do about it if you're elected? Well, I think one of the reasons why Congress has such a low approval rating is so few pol politicians are willing to come forward and state what the truth is and have an on honest dialogue with the American people. Uh, one of the reasons why I have been as successful as I have uh, back home in my state Senate district and was reelected with 70% of the vote was when I go back home and I talk to those that elected me, I tell them what the problems are. We have an honest dialogue and we propose solutions. And that's how we're going to move this country forward. And I think when Congress steps to the plate and looks America in the eye and says, these are what our problems are, and these are the solutions that we, can, that we can put forward to address these problems, I think their approval rating will go dramatically higher. My question also is for Mr. Rouser. You mentioned before that um, you would pledge not to raise any taxes and to cut Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, et cetera, and cuts across the government spectrum in order to meet a lower budget and to cut the deficit. How do you then maintain that you're going to be able to help these people other than putting them on the streets begging? I think you've been watching the wrong ads. <laughs> I have never said that I would cut Social Security. I have never said that I would vote to cut Medicare. The way we address our budget issue is twofold. We must grow the economy. When you grow the economy, you have more revenue coming into the U.S. Treasury. We need to preserve and protect 
Social Security, and Medicare for future generations. And even under the Ryan plan that people like to castigate, no one is affected who is 55 years of age today or older. Not one dime is taken from the paycheck or from the benefits provided through Medicare or Social Security under that plan, Medicare specifically, unlike the ads that are on TV. So let's set the record straight on that. Now, when you grow the economy, you have more revenue coming in the, into the Treasury, and I can tell you from my service in the executive branch, there is waste and abuse in every federal agency all across the board. We need to address that. We need, we need to look and see where there's duplication. And where there's duplication and where the states can do a better job, let's block grant the money back to the states so they can do the job that they need to do. Mr. Rouser, what is your position on the request from the insurance company to increase our, uh, the, ta the amount of uh, increase, the 30% for homeowners insurance that they're requesting? as opposed to the rest of the state getting a smaller uh, increase? Well, it's, ab it's absolutely wrong. Uh, you know, folks need to realize all across North Carolina uh, that the coastal portion of this state is very important to the economy. Now, that is a state issue. It's not a federal issue. Uh, but uh, I, would, I would suggest that uh, the folks in this area uh, get together, and I know that you are, and you're going, going up to Raleigh. I believe there's a hearing coming up in the next month or so uh, with the insurance commissioner where those issues can be addressed, and that, that is where it needs to be addressed. Now, one thing at, from the federal perspective, I'm very, a very strong supporter of our national flood insurance program. That's very important in this area, and of course, that obviously would have a direct impact on, on insurance rates. This is for uh, Mr. Rouser. You talked earlier about securing the border. You didn't talk about how you would do that. What are your thoughts on how you would secure the border without building a fence or a wall? Well, number one, I, I think if uh, you go back and listen to what I said, I have signed the Border Protection Pledge, which means a fence, a wall, and every other measure available uh, to secure the border. And I am serious about that commitment. I don't sign any pledge that I'm not serious about, number one. Number two, we must put in place worker visa programs, guest worker programs, so that the farmers of this state and others can get the labor that they need when they need it. When you do that, if you have a good workable system where folks can come here and work, and then when they get done with their work, they can go home, guess what? You don't have all these folks paying coyotes money to try to get them across the border. You have a legal channel. We know who they're working for, why they're here, and then when they get done with their work, they go home. That will, that will address the immigration crisis that we have in this country, both measures. Uh, I also have a question for Mr. Rouser. You mentioned bringing uh, market forces to bear on the healthcare field. As an employee of a large company, how this works for me is that I'm a member of the, that company. There's usually only one choice for an insurance company. It's Blue Cross or Blue Shield and no insurance, or Aetna or no insurance. Um, and also, once you're a part of that insurance, they tell you, here's the two or three doctors you can see. How, what is your plan for creating choice and selection in the healthcare field? Well, we have to do a number of things. So one is, I believe that you should be able to take your insurance from one employer to the next, just like you move your 401k. And there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that. Uh, number two is, you ought to be able to compete across state lines. If Illinois or Idaho or whoever has an insurance plan that uh, meets your needs, uh, that is more affordable, uh, then you ought to be able to purchase that. That would help to bring about some insurance. And of course, in order to do that, you've got to get rid of some of the rules and regulations that are in place at the federal level. Uh, in addition, those that are small employers, uh, those who are small businesses, they ought to be able to come together and pool their resources, what they call associated health plans, where you can have realtors pool together, where you can have farmers pool together, and therefore you have more purchasing power uh, in order to buy uh, and have more leverage to, to, to be able to buy an insurance product that's affordable. Uh, so there's a number of things that we need to do in order to create more transparency and, and more competition, and that's just a few of them, and it's too difficult to address all of them in one minute, but that's a good start. All right, thank you. Okay, I think we'll take uh, 
One more question from the audience. Again, Mr. Rouse, I'd like to know a little more about you. And uh, North and South Carolina have lost a lot of jobs because of the textile industry. South Carolina has been very aggressive in bringing in new industry. This county, uh, over the past year or two, had the possibility, for, and again, this is the taxpayers, not somebody who's up in Raleigh, of bringing in a couple of large industries into Brunswick County. And it appears to the local taxpayer that our legislature was just outbid for it. I would like to know what you, what, uh, how you stood on that. Well, first of all, uh, I can tell you that uh, business goes where it is welcome. There are a lot of folks in Brunswick and Columbus that obviously wanted those businesses here, uh, but the nature of our business climate in North Carolina uh, is, is not as competitive as it is in South Carolina and Tennessee and, and elsewhere. We have some of the highest tax, marginal tax rates uh, of any state, uh, certainly as compared to South Carolina. We have rules and regulations that are in place uh, that are more onerous than they are in South Carolina. Uh, so there, there's a business climate aspect that has to be addressed. Now, we took measures in the past two years uh, when we were in the majority, and I was a part of the brand new majority. Uh, we hadn't been in the majority since 1869. We took measures to make for a better business climate, such as regulatory reform, tort reform, uh, all those things. And, and next session, I know they're going to be working on tax reform to help, help bring us a little bit more in line uh, with South Carolina. Uh, what, what but as far as any specific vote, uh, there was no specific vote uh, in, in the Senate. There was nothing that was brought forward uh, that I'm aware of that was dealing with those particular, uh, particular companies. What about okay, financial? thank you very much. That concludes the uh, questions from the audience. Again, we thank our candidates on the first panel. Uh, we're going to take a 10-minute break and reconvene at 7.15. We will have the uh, House candidates for both District 17 and 18, as well as the Senate candidates uh, and one of the uh, candidates for Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. I want to uh, recognize two other uh, candidates for judicial offices who are with us tonight, uh, one being Julie Wanda Bryant, who's running for the North Carolina Court of Appeals, and District Court Judge George Cox, who is obviously running for that uh, particular position. So I'd like to uh, welcome you to our uh, session. Uh, the second session is a... Uh, one more directed at the state issues that you know are facing all of us and uh, going to be facing both the uh, House, the Senate, the go Lieutenant Governor's Office. And we have a bit larger panel on this uh, session. Uh, starting at my far right is uh, Dan Forrest, Republican uh, candidate for Lieutenant Governor, Susie Hamilton, uh, candidate for North Carolina House District 18, Louis Harmati, North Carolina House District 18, Frank Eiler, candidate for North Carolina House District 17, Lundia Washington, also a candidate <coughs> for House District number 17, uh, Danny <coughs> Hefner, candidate for North Carolina Senate District 8, and Senator Bill Rabin, candidate for Senate District 8. Uh, we will use the same format as we did uh, with the first session, and there will also be an opportunity for uh, questions from the floor. And uh, John, if you'll go ahead and start this off. Thank you, Bill, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for taking the time out of your schedules this evening to be here. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, and we hope that the uh, voters in the audience this evening uh, appreciate it as well. Uh, I am not, uh, as we said before, you will each have uh, two minutes for an opening statement, 60 seconds to answer the questions, uh, and then a two-minute closing statement. I will not cut you off mid-sentence uh, if you're in the middle of a thought. However, I probably will not allow you to start a new thought once that time frame goes on. We do want to try to get as many questions in as we possibly can. Uh, right down front, uh, if we, our timekeeper is down front, if you'll notice, 
Uh, you'll get the yield sign at uh, when you have 15 seconds left. You'll get the stop sign when you are uh, on the clock out of time. I've done my best uh, to try to devise a number pattern here so that all of you are not following the same person. You will hopefully each get a chance to answer a question first, second, third, fourth, and not always be following the same. And that way we will mix it up. You won't always be responding with the person you're running against to try to get a, uh, try to be a little more fair to all the candidates. I, I feel that it's fair to uh, begin with our opening statements and we'll just go alphabetically right down the line. So we will begin with candidate for Lieutenant Governor, Mr. Dan Forrest. Mr. Forrest, two minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. It is uh, great to be back with you in Brunswick County. Uh, my name is Dan Forrest, and I am the Republican nominee for Lieutenant Governor. And uh, my background is business, not politics. I was a senior partner and office president with the largest architecture firm in the state. I did that for 23 years. I put that career on hold to go serve you in Raleigh because I believe that we have a great leadership crisis at the executive level in North Carolina. As was mentioned early for the, earlier, for the first time in 140 years, we have Republican control of the House and the Senate. I believe they've done their constitutional duty to balance the budget, cutting $3 billion out of the budget uh, to balance it, which is, again, a constitutional responsibility they have. But I believe that there have been some great challenges at the executive level, and those are impacting our state. We're uh, 44th in the nation in business tax climate. We have the high, highest corporate income tax rate in the Southeast, the highest personal income tax in the Southeast, the highest gas tax in the Southeast. These things are bad for business, and these are things that we need to change. We're also somewhere between 27th and 41st in the nation in K-12 education. That's not acceptable for our great state. I believe firmly that we need to break the state government controlled monopoly on education and introduce choice. And when we do that, we will have innovation uh, that will lead to competition and competition will rise the tide for all the ships in education. And so that's something that we need to do right away. The Lieutenant Governor presides over the Senate, holds the gavel in the Senate, uh, by constitution sits on the North Carolina State School Board, sits on the North Carolina Board of Community, Co community Colleges, and sits on the North Carolina Board of Economic Development. Uh, my background as an architect, uh, we are visionaries, planners, uh, creative problem solvers, consensus builders. These are the types of leadership skills and qualities that I believe we need uh, in Raleigh to help paint a long-term envisioned future for our state. So I look forward to serving you over the next four years as your next Lieutenant Governor. Mr. Forrest, thank you. Next, for a two-minute opening statement, we will go to candidate for District 18 in the North Carolina House, Susie Hamilton. Ms. Hamilton. Thank you, John. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Susie Hamilton, and I am the current uh, House Representative for District 18, which now encompasses uh, the downtown portion of Wilmington and New Hanover County and the northwestern portions of Brunswick County. I am a small business owner with a background in city planning and downtown economic development. Uh, my husband Steve and I have an eight-year-old daughter, she'll be eight on Friday, um, named Parker. And uh, I own a small business today, so I'm familiar with what it takes to run a small business, raise a family, and, and work um, for the greater good of, of the general public through my public service uh, in the General Assembly. Um, I have a master's degree in public administration from UNCW, graduated in 2004, and I've parlayed that experience in, with, uh, with local government and state government and in the private sector into working with competing needs and balancing those competing needs in the General Assembly. We see a lot of issues that come through the General Assembly. Uh, people dealing with issues related to public education, people dealing with issues related to social services, um, uh, retirement issues, uh, people who are struggling with um, illnesses and disabilities. And um, we also deal with issues related to infrastructure, building roads, and protecting our citizens and, and guarding their safety. So as you can see, it's, it's, a, it's a lot to juggle in the General Assembly. There are lots of competing needs, but I have spent my career um, serving the public and working on multiple boards and commissions in our region to, to continue to serve the citizens of District 18, and I'm looking forward to doing that in the next couple of years. Thank you. Ms. Hamilton, thank you. Next for his opening statement, two minutes for candidate Louis Harmadi. Mr. Harmadi. <coughs> thank you, John. I'm Louis Harmadi. I'm running for District 18. And I decided to run for office because I'm concerned about the direction our state and nation is going with high unemployment rates, with uh, 
shrinking social programs and really too much business regulations at all levels of government, especially environmental regulations. Uh, I served in Vietnam for one year, in the Middle East for another year, in Europe for uh, several months. I was in the Army Reserves and the National Guard for over 20 years. I'm a retired military commander right here from Wilmington. I was commander of the Reserve Center in Wilmington, North Carolina. I've resided in Wilmington area for over 40 years. I have, uh, we have six children, 14 grandchildren. I think some of them are sitting right there in a row. Why don't you all stand up real quick, everybody? <laughs> and uh, we have a big family, and most of them live right here in this region, by the way, in, in the Cape Fear region and all that. I'll probably get 20 votes from them, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> I was a small business owner in Wilmington. I owned a convenient mart. Uh, one of my first businesses was in the African-American community on Nesbitt Court area on Kidder Street. I also taught uh, real estate fundamentals statewide, and I also sold uh, insurance products for New York Life in Wilmington uh, for about eight years. So I've been living in Wilmington since 1985 in the state for, 40, for almost over 40 years and over 30 years in Wilmington area. As I said, I have six children, 14 grandchildren. My background is in accounting. Uh, I majored in accounting at Business Administration Campbell University. After graduation, graduating from college, I decided to go to seminary at Wake Forest. Uh, uh, my faith is very important to me. As a result of that, uh, you know, I decided to run for, for to, to, to study for the ministry for a short time. I started archaeology and religion there, and I preached at a few small churches. A and today, is, my faith is just as, as uh, important as it was 30 years ago. Uh, I, I have an insurance, I have a, a accounting degree, insurance licenses, real estate licenses, all from North Carolina. Mr. Harmati, that's two minutes, that's sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We'll go right down the line, and we will continue with opening statements. Two minutes now for uh, uh, candidate Mr. <laughs> Frank Eiler, running for North Carolina House 17. Mr. Eiler. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bill, and uh, ABC POA for hosting this and the folks that showed up here today. Hope we have a lot of good answers for you. Uh, I've lived in North Carolina since age 14. Uh, I've lived in five different counties in North Carolina, done business in, in five different counties, got a business background. I moved here 13 years ago. My wife, Jackie, who's sitting right down here, she introduced me to Brunswick County uh, about 22 years ago and uh, we moved here 13 years ago, and uh, fell in love with it, and I retired in 2005, then I really got busy. Some of you can identify with that. In 06, I got involved in my party activities, and then in 09, my friend left the legislature, and I replaced him, and was reelected in 2010. So I've served a term and a half. I've served in the minority and in the majority uh, party, and it's uh, a lot more work, but a lot more can be accomplished in the majority. See, after 140 years of one-party rule, we made great strides in 2011 and 2012. We had to balance a budget with a $3 billion shortfall. We did that with the help of the Senate and the House members. And we, uh, uh, we were able to accomplish a lot in regulation reform as well as uh, tax reform. There's a lot more to be done. And I ask for your support to continue our progress. And I ask for your vote on uh, November 6th. I actually, start voting tomorrow morning, the 18th, at early voting. Thank you very much. Mr. Eiler, thank you. Also running for the House seat in District 17. Two-minute opening statement now for candidate Lindia Washington. Ms. Washington. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Lindia Washington, and I want to be your State House representative. I like Mr. Eiler here, and I'm sorry that this is the way things happen, but I'm going to give him a run for your vote. Uh, I, I'm a highly experienced educator with a master's degree in counseling from Clark Atlanta University in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm, in a, I'm a parent that has successfully raised eight accomplished children, and I have 25 years of public service. Uh, also, I have um, a, um, been a small business owner in, in real estate, of which um, I was very successful. I am presently on the board of, uh, what is it, the board of adjustments here in Brunswick County. In addition, I uh, previously served on the um, Southeastern Area Mental Health Board. I'm a well-traveled individual and have first experience, first-hand experiences 
and I understand the importance of education and economic development and women's empowerment and affordable health care and senior issues. Uh, if you believe, like me, if you think that these are important issues and you uh, want to support those things, then vote for me and we can work together to make things happen. Thank you much. Ms. Washington, thank you. Continuing our list of candidates this <laughs> evening, a two-minute opening statement now for Danny Hefner running for the Senate seat in the 8th District. Mr. Hefner. Good evening. My name is Danny Hefner, and I am the Democratic candidate for the North Carolina State Senate District 8. I would like to thank the ABCPOA and all the other sponsors that made this event possible, as well as I'd like to thank you, Mr. Evans, for being our moderator this evening. My history is very simple. I am a former active duty United States Marine officer. I have a engineering degree, Bachelor of Science from Belford University in Engineering Management. I am a therapeutic foster parent where I do in-home behavior modification and life skills training for neglected and abused children. I am also a truck driver. I have been both a company driver and an owner operator. During that time, I have put in close to one million miles on America's highways. With all that being said, I am now a member of the Board of Directors for the Knott Foundation, a fledgling foundation that is dedicated to uplifting people out of poverty with providing them continuing education for free. We in the Knott Foundation are currently feeding more than 400 families here in the Brunswick County area alone that are without food, and we're doing that on a weekly basis via the backpack program. I have been an adoptive parent, I have been vetted fully by the state, and I have been endorsed by several working, workers groups on my plans and policies that I would like to bring to our state senate. Those plans are to incentivize on the state level at the time that I take office as your next state senator to put those incentives in place today so that our county commissioners and our current economic development committees do not have to approach our general assembly with their hats in their hands asking if we can please employ our people. With that being said, I would also like to bring back technical and vocational training to our high schools. Our children are our future. I have had my careers. With that being said, my next career that I'm asking you to please allow me to do. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Our last opening statement this evening will come from another candidate running for the Senate seat in the 8th District, Mr. Bill Rabin. Mr. Rabin, two minutes. Thank you, John, and uh, thank you, ABC POA, for putting this on and having us here tonight. It's a pleasure to be out with the constituents. Uh, I am Senator Bill Rabin, and I've enjoyed serving you for the past two years and would like to continue so. We were asked to give our priorities and our vision, and I will give those to you uh, now. I think we need a more competitive tax structure in this state, uh, decreasing corporate taxes, franchise taxes, and personal income taxes, eliminating wasteful spending, and reducing excessive uh, government regulations. 1,500 of which I was instrumental in reducing or getting rid of in my first two years. Um, these are crippling our daily lives in small business and personal. Uh, I would like to see improved education with more spending in K through 12, and I'd like to see more support for our community colleges job training program. Our natural resources, uh, I'm well aware of as a lifelong uh, <clears throat> person from Eastern North Carolina and uh, 37 years in Brunswick County. Uh, I know the value of our tourism industry as well as our abundant uh, <clears throat> fossil fuel and uh, offshore natural resources. Uh, I'm making a difference in the North Carolina Senate. I co-chair three very important committees on transportation. I vice chair finance. I am on the program evaluation committee, health committee, and the very powerful Senate rules committee. I'm also uh, was, had the pleasure of being the president of the freshman class of the North Carolina Senate, I think the most effective and strongest freshman class in the history of the North Carolina. I take to me, I take uh, with me to Raleigh courage, physical, physically conservative values, and strong leadership capabilities. Uh, I hope that you have seen that in the past two years and I'm running on my record. Thank you, sir. In the first question, uh, let us go to uh, Mr. Eilor. I'm going to ask for your response first to the first question, <laughs> sir. 
Coastal counties have seen very significant rate increases for homeowners insurance, especially wind and hail coverage over the past several years, while the rest of the state has seen small to moderate increases. Question to you, sir, what specifically do you intend to do to even out or roll back these excessive homeowners insurance increases? 60 seconds. Okay, well, two things. I've been told by the insurance commissioner that this recent rate filing of 30 percent is not going to happen. Uh, the, uh, what we did already is I was in a joint uh, property insurance rate making committee uh, during the interim uh, this past year. We came out with a bill, Senate Bill 836, which did four things and is going to hopefully will have a lot more to do along this line. It requires public opinion for the first time it requires it. And that actually the first uh, public opinion hearing was today in Raleigh on this rate filing. The commissioner will now have the flexibility to choose a rate between what is asked for and what is in zero. And I was pushing for him to be able to do a negative rate, but that didn't quite make it into the bill. Uh, require the industry to offer a separate wind and hail policy. You don't, don't, have, don't have to buy that if you don't want it. And then the Department of Insurance to, Department of Insurance to study the fairness of the rate territories they're using now. One that didn't get in that we recommended, didn't get into the bill, okay. was to use a different model using claims history, not just projected hurricanes and that sort of thing. Thank you, sir. Claims history. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Eiler. Ms. Washington, I ask you, ma'am, what specifically do you intend to do to even out or roll back excessive homeowners insurance increases? First of all, I don't think it's right or equitable. And I'm the type of person that if there's something that needs to be done, I get it done. And it takes um, speaking out about it forcefully, making sure that we are heard in any way that uh, any forum that we're given. And I would um, actually entertain or ask for public support, a grassroots approach uh, to uh, make our wishes known so that we can have a say in the recommendations and not just feel like we're citizens sitting on the sideline with things happening without our control. Thank you. Ms. Washington, thank you. Mr. Forrest, I ask you, sir, what specifically would you intend to do if elected to even out or roll back excessive homeowners insurance increases along the coast? Uh, well, as, as mentioned, uh, this is a um, case for the insurance commissioner primarily. I intend first to vote for Mike Causey for insurance commissioner uh, and uh, change the leadership there in Raleigh. Uh, but again, I think it's already been stated that this issue is well underway. People are uh, addressing this in the House and the Senate right now, uh, certainly for the first time in uh, quite a few years. I know that the coast is an easy target, and the coast is an easy target generally on big storm years, and uh, that happens because we start projecting into the future that uh, those storms are going to end up happening every year in that manner, and so we uh, come up with insurance policy based on a bad storm year. But it, there certainly has to be more equity uh, across the state, and uh, I think the, the measures that are being taken now with public forums is, the, is a good start for that. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rabin, I ask for your response. What specifically do you intend to do to even out or roll back excessive homeowners insurance increases? Thank you, sir. Uh, most of it has been said, but I'll hitchhike on it a little bit. The Insurance Commission in North Carolina is a constitutional uh, position, and so our hands are tied somewhat uh, in what we do and what we don't do. However, the legislature has already passed legislation to make this uh, process more transparent, as you saw today, uh, some 2,000 people signed up uh, to, to go to the hearing and the meeting today, and that is uh, still open. Uh, I would like to see uh, a cap, if you will, put on the amount that an insurance company can rise. I would also like to see uh, the uh, method put all the way across the, street, the state, not just the 20 coastal counties. I think that's discriminatory. We should look at the whole state and possibly even look at the entire regions. Uh, if we're talking about hurricanes, we can do North, South Carolina, and even Virginia together and look at historical data, not predictive data. Mr. Rabin, thank you. Mr. Hefner, I ask you, sir, what you would intend to do to even out or roll back excessive homeowners insurance increases along the coast. Thank you. The first thing that I would like to see happen is a, a productive survey um, or a survey conducted on the statistical models, statistical data statewide. The way that North Carolina is designed, for lack of a better way to put it, uh, there is a area where it creates a natural trough that takes and sh basically shoves those hurricanes directly up through the center of the state. 
uh, in when Hurricane Hugo came through as an example, I was stationed at Jacksonville. Hurricane Hugo came across the top of my house. However, everything in my parents' yard in Granite Falls, North Carolina, 300 miles away, was destroyed. My home was left un unharmed. The statistical data is that which <laughs> these insurance companies need to base their, their insurance rates on. One, the House and the Senate must stand united to prevent this from happening. Two, we must take a look at these rates, and those rates should never increase by more than the cost of inflation. Thank you, sir. Mr. Haramadi, I ask you, sir, what specifically would you do, intend to do to even out a rollback excessive homeowners insurance increases? Well, I sold insurance in North Carolina. I have insurance license. It expired, but I'm concerned about insurance greatly. And, and, I, and 10 years ago, I think the county, coastal county sued the state for better equitable treatment for the coastal area so we get the, uh, better rates than what, what we're doing now. And I also was researching, and I was talking to, I think, uh, Mr. Idley here a week ago talking about, well, you know, what can we do at, at the legislature level to improve our, uh, our, our risk, uh, risk uh, uh, distribution across the state so the coastal region don't have to bear all the burden of losses when actually we have losses in the Piedmont and the mountains sometimes greater than we do in the coast from the same hurricane. So when I get elected, that's one of the things that I'm going to be hard pressed on because I live on the coast. My policy is 3,000 a year, and I'm upset about it and, and been concerned about it for the last 10 years. So I want to do something about it, and, and I want to do something about it through the legislature, if possible, to change the way, way we do business and the way we, uh, we, uh, we take those risks and, and uh, distribute. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank Ms. You. Hamilton, I ask for your response, ma'am. What specifically do you intend to do? to even out a rollback, excessive homeowners insurance increases along the coast. Thank you, John. Uh, I was a, a primary sponsor of the bill that, uh, that led to the study committee that uh, Representative Eiler referred to a few minutes ago that ultimately passed. Uh, we've not gone far enough yet, but creating the transparency in the process was, was a huge um, feat in, in, in as coastal homeowners because for so long the insurance uh, industry had resisted us having any part of a public process to have a discussion about rate increases. One thing I think you need to remember is that we're not talking about hurricanes in this most recent rate increase request. This is basic homeowner's insurance, as if it was more likely that our house is going to burn down or be broken into than a house, say, in Greensboro or Charlotte. This is not a Republican or a Democratic issue. This is an East versus West issue, and we have got to continue to fight for the coast and the property owners on the coast. I don't know about you all, but I pay twice as much in property insurance in basic homeowners than I do in property taxes. Thank you. Ms. Hamilton, I'm going to ask uh, for your response first to the next question, ma'am, if I can. Education is imperative to the future success of our state <laughs> and our country. In fact, many of you mentioned education in your opening statements. Budgets have uh, decreased. The number of students in the classroom has increased over the years. Question, will you support education through increased funding in the General Assembly and the state budget? Ms. Hamilton? Yes. We'll get more questions in that way. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, you do have 60 pu seconds. Pu public education is, is a core foundation of the state of North Carolina, from pre-K education all the way through the university systems and in, into the community college systems. In fact, it's what separates us in the South from other Southern states who have not shown as much initiative, nor have they shown as much success in public education as the Southern state of North Carolina. And I'm very proud to have been a person that was educated in the public school system here in North Carolina. I believe very much in our students. I believe very much in our teachers. And I believe very much in our constitutional responsibility to educate every child in the state of North Carolina using the public education process. I will continue to support it. I will continue to support teachers. I will continue to support administrators. And I will continue to fight to fund public education. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Rabin, I ask for your response. Will you continue to support education through increased funding in the state budget? Uh, yes, John, not only will I continue, I did. Uh, as I'm sure everyone recalls, the last state budget, not the federal budget, ladies and gentlemen, but the last state budget uh, increased K through 12 spending by $255 million. Uh, in fact, the, it increased uh, the state level funding for teachers to a higher level than the last Purdue Dalton budget. It fully funded the state uh, level, all classroom teachers. So yes, I will continue to do that. 
Uh, it provided $27 million for education reform. Uh, so I have already voted to uh, increase spending. We're just going to spend our dollars uh, in the classroom. We're going to spend our education dollars wisely, and we're not going to throw them away. We're going to hold uh, <clears throat> the Department of Education uh, accountable for how it spends the money that you send to Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. Rabin. Ms. Washington, I ask for your response. Will you support education through increased funding in the state budget? Of course. I was a, a, an educator myself for 25 years, and I understand how important funding for education is. I think it's the so, single most important investment we can make in our society because that's where it all begins. I believe uh, that um, there must be some reform along with that, though, because our education system is based on uh, a society that was um, uh, built on raising people for uh, work in factories and things that are somewhat outdated for today's economy. So we do need to make some changes, but I would be in favor of making those changes with whatever funding is necessary to do it. But Ms. Washington, thank you. Mr. Hefner, I ask you, sir, would you support education through increased funding in the General Assembly state budget? Yes, I will. Um, the senator and I differ here at, at, at this particular point, and it's because I've taken my information directly from the State Board of Education Department of Public Instruction. During the 2011-2013 biennial budget cycle, the budget for the education was cut by more than one billion dollars, $500 million per year. The money that he is talking about that was placed back into the state coffers or state education fund, the $255 million, was actually money that was actually transferred in the 2010 budget back to the general fund, at which point that money was replaced then by federal education dollars. So that's a shell game. Right now, the actual loss of jobs is what's causing our education system to go down. Everything <laughs> must work hand in hand, and that is where we need to bring our jobs back to fund our educational system. Thank you, sir. Mr. Eiler, I ask you, would you support education through increased funding in the state budget? Uh, yes, I will, and I, I did. Uh, we, in our budget, we did add $255 million in state dollars, but we lost a billion almost in federal dollars. That's part of that three billion shortfall we had. I would also support, we also had the first teachers increase in four years. We all, I would support uh, technical education. I would support community colleges tremendously because we, uh, I'm on a board that runs a community college and it is Senator Rabin and we are fighting hard for community colleges and the technical education should be in high school, not just after high school keep our dropouts down, and give them a skill when they finish high school. Thank you. Mr. Eiler, thank you. Mr. Forrest, would you support education through increased funding in the state budget? I don't know. It depends on what that money's going towards. You know, every year we say we need more money for education. Over the last 40 years, we have uh, increased our education budget 375%. I think it needs to be based on performance, and I think we need to track that performance year by year to make sure that we're getting our money's worth. We are spending a vast majority of our state budget every year on education. It's a great, a great investment, certainly, and we need to do that. We need to make that investment, but we need to have accountability in that investment. We need to have complete transparency with the Department of Public Instruction. We have 900 employees at the DPI in Raleigh. We have 5,000 employees at the Department of Education in Washington, D.C. And I want to know what these folks are doing and how they're providing to the uh, education process in North Carolina and right here in Brunswick County. As I mentioned earlier, we're somewhere between 27th and 41st in the nation in K-12 education. So I believe we need to have an education revolution in North Carolina. I, like I said as well earlier, we need to break the state government controlled monopoly on education and introduce choice and create innovation at new levels that we've never seen before in our state and create that through competition. Petition, and I think you will provide great opportunities for all the students in our state when we do that. Mr. Forrest, thank you. Mr. Harmadi, would you support education through increased funding in the state budget? Okay, I taught at Shaw University for five years. I also taught in the North Carolina public school system, and I know about education a little bit myself. Uh, in Europe, they spend $3,000 per student to educate them, and they're a lot better educated than students in America. And uh, in America, we spend $7,000, $8,000 per student. 
and we're not getting the quality education we deserve. I have 14 grandchildren. I'm concerned about education, and I want to fight for education. Some, some, some of the problems in education, is, is, is some of the people might have stated, is we have too many high bureaucratic overhead <laughs> costs, and uh, some of this overhead cost that could be saved can be spread uh, down to lower classroom size, increased teacher salary, teacher bonuses, incentives, especially for the, the more, more exceptional teachers in the educational system. We need more new technologies. Uh, I don't think teachers should be buying the teaching material. It's appalling that they have to buy it on the salaries. And I also believe in school choice and, and the money that the state offers for the students should go where the student goes to school, not where the school goes, not to the school system. Thank so, you, sir. Is that done? That's time. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Washington, I'm going to ask for you to respond first to the next question, ma'am, if I may. What is your position on voter ID in the polling place? Well, that's, that's a very controversial issue. Uh, my stand is that um, voter ID because it was sprung at a very last, at the last minute to this election, created some resistance, uh, even in my mind. I think it's a good thing if it's done properly, if it's done orderly, and it does not disenfranchise people. But it's going to cause us to have to put some money behind uh, the effort of enforcing it. Because if people are not able to pay for the ID, or if the ID is so, uh, that is selected is so stringent that people cannot uh, get what they need, then we really need to revise it in, in some way. Thank you. Ms. Washington, thank you. I will go to Mr. Harmadi. Mr. Harmadi, what is your position on voter ID at the polling place? Okay, voter ID. 69% uh, of people in North Carolina through a WRAL news post said they want voter ID. 10% said they want an ID, but doesn't have to be a picture ID. That's 79% of people in the state want voter ID. Uh, 30 states have voter IDs laws, and 33 of them are looking into getting it. Now, voter integrity is critical to a free society and a free nation. Anyone can take over a country if we don't have a, pro if we don't have a proper voter, voter system. I came from a communist country, and I saw firsthand how the communists took over a duly elected parliament in Budapest, Hungary, through voter fraud and other frauds and methods. So I, I also believe that, that uh, I also checked in today, there is mechanism set up where people that, are, that are, don't have the money to buy an ID card or can't get to an ID place like a DMV, we have free transportation set up through the Brunswick Senior Resource Center, it don't cost them a dime. I think it costs one buck or two dollars to do, do an ID. Thank uh, you, sir. You can get it to DMV, and every, let me finish real quick. Everyone's Thank got you, IDs, sir. school IDs, work IDs, Democratic parties have IDs. Mr. Harmadi, that's time, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Eiler, I ask for you, what is your position on voter ID at the polling place? Well, John, I'm glad you asked that because I served on the elections committee, which put forth a voter ID bill, a picture ID bill, in the last session. As most of you may have read, the governor vetoed it. We could not override that particular veto. Uh, 75 to 80 percent of people want that uh, for to protect the integrity of the vote. Uh, just because we don't convict everybody that walks in and votes in somebody else's name doesn't mean that, that it's not happening. And uh, a lot of uh, anecdotal evidence that it is happening. Uh, Georgia's got a good example. The ID is free. It's a picture ID. Uh, if you can't come get it, they'll bring it to you. They'll make sure you get a picture ID, whatever they have to do. If you can get to the polling place to vote, you can certainly get to wherever it is to get a voter ID. And I believe that's definitely something we have to have. It'll come up again if I have anything to do with it in the next session. And I hope to be part of the elections committee again and be our primary sponsor of the bill to do that. Mr. Arler, thank you. Mr. Forrest, what is your position on voter ID at the polling place? Well, it's already been mentioned multiple times. I'm definitely in favor of it. I think that, again, when I mentioned that we have a leadership crisis in North Carolina, you will see that we had a, a governor that uh, disagreed with what about 80 percent of the people of North Carolina thought we should do by providing a photo ID at the ballot box. And so I think it's something that will come up probably in January of 2013. I will be strongly in favor of that. Thank you, sir. Mr. Rabin, what is your position on voter ID at the polling place? Thank you, sir. I have a very strong uh, position in favor of voter ID. Uh, we passed it through the Senate without a hitch. Uh, I think one of the failures of the General Assembly was being unable to pass it uh, 
and, and override the veto. Uh, I do pledge to do that if reelected as soon as possible. I think that the right to vote is one of our most sacred rights, uh, that we should take all steps possible to remove fraud from that so that the voice of the people is heard and is legal and is done. I'm sure that in any instance that, uh, that this state will provide an ID for anyone that needs an ID. If we work as hard as we do on uh, voter registration, I'm sure we can vote that hard on, uh, work that hard on uh, mm -hmm. um, getting uh, our voters a proper ID so that uh, we can know that uh, who votes for us is voting for us. Thank you, sir. Ms. Hamilton, your position on voter ID at the polling place? I voted against it. I will continue to vote against it. It disenfranchises voters. Um, it is a politically motivated strategy to keep voters from um, coming to the polls. Students, the elderly, uh, minority voters. But more than anything, guys, it's another government program. You've heard all of the, the candidates up here tonight who've answered this question already talk about driving people to get their ID and driving people to the polls and providing a free picture ID for them. That's all cost coming from the government, your taxpayer dollars. In other states where voter ID programs have been put into place, they are multi-million dollar programs. I didn't go to Raleigh to create new subsidy programs, and I considered the voter ID process to be a multi-million dollar process that would cost the citizens and the taxpayers of North Carolina lots of money, and unnecessarily so. The Republican Party of North Carolina has just recently had to let go of their research, the research company that was working for them because they found absolutely no evidence of voter fraud in this state. Ms. Hamilton, thank you. Mr. Hefner, I ask you, sir, what is your position on voter ID at the polling place? My position is exactly like Representative Hamilton's. I would stand against a voter ID bill and a voter ID law. I am in full agreement with her that it does disenfranchise minority and elderly voters. And when it comes down to the point of where it does cost and create cost, and as we go further on to the evening, I hope to have the opportunity to show you some unnecessary programs that, are, that do need to be cut. Now, with that being said, we have many different things that we need to concentrate on in this state, other than whether a person is going to carry an ID to the polls. If you want to have an ID at the polls, then you need to make it a voter referendum and, if possible, make it a constitutional amendment. Allow it to be put before the people, allow them to make the decision instead of it being party politics that affect people's lives. Thank you, sir. Mr. Harmadi, I would like your response first to the next question, sir, if I can. Transportation <laughs> continues to be a major source of concern for residents in southeastern North Carolina. Always a case of too many requirements and not enough money. Question, what specific actions would you take to ensure that funds are spent in a reasonable and efficient way and maximize the impact on those scarce resources? Okay, on transportation, spending more money on transportation? Yes, sir. Okay. Well, you know, the problem has always been in, in this state, in many states in the nation, that uh, the highway trust fund is always being raided, just like the Social Security trust fund has been raided. That's why we're in the trouble we're in with Social Security, same trouble with, uh, with the highway trust fund. And uh, that's one of the things that's appalling to me as a citizen, and certainly be appalling to me as, as, a, as a, a legislature. And uh, we have the worst roads in North Carolina. We're graded at, at a, a C minus for infrastructure, a C for rail, a D for, for highways, and, uh, and, and we also have the highest tax in southeastern United States on, uh, on the gasoline tax for our roads. And we have the poorest roads, the worst service. I don't know what Raleigh's doing with that money, do you? Come on, tell me what one's doing. I'm upset. That's one of the reasons I'm running for office. I want to find out what's going on with all this money that we should be, we should have the best roads in the whole, whole uh, United States with all the money with the gasoline tax and, and all the money we spend on, on highways. I know the highway Thank department you, is inefficient too. Thank you, sir. Mr. Hefner, I ask you, what specific actions would you take to ensure the transportation funds are spent in a reasonable and efficient way to maximize their impact? The first thing that we need to do is bring our highways in North Carolina up to 21st century standards. As a truck driver, I can tell you personally that the Eisenhower interstate system was built to 1940s, 1950s codes, and they are not meant to withstand 80,000 pound loads coming uh, down the road on a continual basis. One, we do need to quit rating our highway use fund. Senator Rabin and I and a couple, uh, Representative Eiler and Representative, or, uh, Candidate Washington were in a meeting and in, it was specifically stated during that meeting that more than uh, cl or close to $300 million was taken from 
the highway use fund and placed into the general fund. The Senator also stated during that particular <laughs> meeting that the highway use tax in North Carolina can never be capped. We need to budget our money soundly. We need to create the jobs that will provide the money for our infrastructure. Everything goes back to the jobs issue in this state. Everything. Thank you, sir. Ms. Hamilton, what specific actions will you take to ensure that funds are spent in a reasonable and efficient way on transportation to maximize their impact? This is the age-old question for North Carolina politicians. Um, you know, we've been known uh, for many years, 100 years, as the good road state in North Carolina. We have, if I'm not mistaken, the second um, highest number of miles uh, uh, per capita. I think we're second only to, to Texas in that regard, that, that, that are state-maintained roads. Um, asphalt isn't getting any cheaper. Um, property has gotten cheaper over the, over, during this recession period we've been in, but it costs a lot of money to build roads, acquire property to build roads, and build bridges, and maintain those roads and bridges. Um, the gas tax is one way that we uh, fund those roads. Other states don't have as high a gas tax, but they have special option taxes and higher property taxes in some instances, depending on the state, that they use to fund their highways and, and maintenance of, of those systems. We've got to find a different formula to make that work, and I've worked very closely with Senator Rabin and, Sen and Representative Eiler, and um, we'll continue to do so if reelected. Mr. Rabin, what specific actions would you take to ensure the transportation funds are spent in a reasonable and efficient way to maximize their impact? Thank you, sir. Uh, the first thing I would um, address and like to do is to uh, stop the cannibalizing of the uh, highway fund and the highway trust fund by the general fund. Uh, we are transferring about $300 million, or we did last year, into the general fund. Uh, part of that came because we transferred the highway patrol from the Department of Transportation into the uh, Crime and Public Safety Division, so we had to send the money with them. But I would uh, like very much to see that. That $300 million would mean a six cents drop in your uh, gasoline tax, just for you folks that would like to know. I would also like to ensure that we have a constant revenue stream and that when we tell people that money is going to be used for transportation, it will be used for transportation and it won't be used for anything else. I sit in a position to do that in the Senate as chair of the uh, Transportation Committee, Appropriations on Transportation and Joint Oversight Committee on Transportation. Thank you, sir. Ms. Washington, what specific actions would you take to ensure that transportation funds are spent in a reasonable and efficient way to maximize their impact? Well, I'd like to say that um, Vehicle registration is very low here. I paid $28 to register my automobile, and I, I lived in uh, California for several years, in Georgia for years, and I have never seen such low um, registration fees. We need to uh, look for different ways to bring in money so that we can have the money that we need to uh, provide us with uh, improved highways and um, uh, freeways uh, so that our um, transportation system can be 21st century. Um, it also, if, if we are able, when, excuse me, I'll just leave that part out. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Washington. Mr. Forrest, what specific actions would you take to ensure that funds on transportation are spent in a reasonable and efficient way? Well, I'll be the first to admit that there are certain road needs out there, but I've also driven about 200,000 miles across the state in the last 20 months, and I would say that we have a very good road system in North Carolina. I'm on very few roads that are in, very, in poor quality. I'd defer to a truck driver like Mr. Hefner to say what the specifications for those roads should be for trucks, and those probably do need to be upgraded. But there was a study done a few years ago that said had we left the money in the highway fund and the highway trust fund that was put there for these specific purposes, there'd be enough money in North Carolina right now to pay for all new roads, to repair all existing roads, and to repair all the existing bridges in North Carolina as well. But what's happened is the highway fund and the highway 
highway trust fund have been robbed over the past decades and put into the general fund budget or to pay for special projects. And so, uh, you know, my line is that if you have a trust fund of any kind, you need to put it in the hands of people you can trust and get it out of the hands of politicians uh, so that it can grow effectively over time and that money will stay there and be there. And we need to lower our gas tax in North Carolina to be competitive with our southeast neighbors so people stop passing through our state uh, every day, millions of them, uh, or every year, millions of them uh, going through our state rather than stopping to fuel up. Thank you, sir. And Mr. Eiler, your response, what specific actions would you take to ensure that transportation funds are spent in a reasonable and efficient way? First, stop the transfer from trans the transportation funds to the general fund, like everybody, almost everybody else has said. That number over the last 10 to 15 years is $4 billion plus, and that would, rep that would totally redo I-95 without any tolling. It would also repair a lot of bridges and roads that would need repairing and bring us up to speed. Uh, as far as efficiency, I do serve on the, as the chairman of the uh, House Transportation Committee uh, and also on, on the uh, appropriations for transportation and the joint transportation along with Senator Rabin. Uh, Representative Hamilton is on one or two of our committees also. But we have, uh, I've been on the life cycle cost analysis interim committee, but we cut a year and a half off, off, of, one, off of some projects because of the environmental uh, issues. Uh, off of a seven-year project, we cut as much as a year and a half just by rec our recommendations. We've also got, uh, I've got recommendations using concrete and asphalt down the road, a lot of other recommendations to make it a lot more efficient. It's to, you know, the money that we do spend. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, um, Mr. Rabin, I'm going to ask you uh, the respond first to the next question. I'm going to ask a question to you that I asked of the governor's candidates last night. What is your strategy? And with federal funds dwindling, what do you think should be the state's responsibility when it comes to beach renourishment in North Carolina, and how do you fund those needs? Mr. Rabin, 60 seconds. That's a... That's a uh probably a, a double-sided sword, uh, but one that we have discussed in the General Assembly, and I have discussed it uh, uh, extensively myself, because I think that uh, the inlet, inlet dredging, uh, of course, is, should be part of the transportation budget. We can take the sand from the inlets and put it on the beaches. Uh, also, we can give the cities uh, the choice of local um, uh, option taxes on whether they want to use that for beach renourishment <laughs> and what have you. And we have to let the General Assembly know that the beaches are the golden uh, or the shining star of North Carolina. And it's there for everyone. They're not just for the beach communities. They're for the whole state. And uh, we can all work together to ensure that they are uh, maintained and they should be maintained because that also is a money saver in the long run and will help with the insurance rates, et cetera, et cetera, as we go forward. Mr. Rabin, thank you. Mr. Hefner, I ask for your response on what do you think the state's responsibility should be for beach renourishment and dredging, and where should the funding come from? Actually, the funding should come from the statewide fund, where this is concerned, in my opinion. When I moved to the coastal region two and a half years ago, I was going to buy a home that was on Ocean Isle Beach Island that was considered endangered. Now, with that being said, the first thing that needs to be done is it should have worked with the Army Corps of Engineers to actually look at some of those beachheads and look at the satellite photography where those concern. In this area, the water or the, the currents run northwesterly, and that is why most of the sand that was done during the last beach renourishment at Ocean Isle Beach is now on Holden Beach. Now, with that being said, we need to concentrate. There are only two states in the nation that have that do not have hardened groins of any type along their beaches. One is Oregon, the other is North Carolina. We need to work on placing finger jetties at the heads of these Outer Bank Islands so that they capture the sand naturally. That is it, a finger jetty. Thank you, sir. Ms. Washington, I ask for your response, ma'am. What do you think the state's responsibility should be for beach renourishment and dredging along the shorelines? And where should the funding come from? Well, I don't have a strategy for it. And I'm not sure how much of uh, the funds should be used from the State Department for a beach renourishment. But I do have an idea of where we can seek uh, to find other, other monies. Uh, we often talk about uh, private investors and the private sector creating money, creating jobs, and those type of things. So we have to look to 
private, the private sector to solve many of our problems, especially if in our general fund we don't have uh, what we need. So that is my strategy. Thank, thank you, you, sir. Ma'am, thank you, ma'am. Mr. Eiler, I ask for your response. What do you think the state's responsibility should be for beach renourishment and dredging along the shorelines, and where should the funding come from? I've been very involved in this with the terminal groin issue to help some of our beaches uh, establish terminal groins to trap sand. Basically, you put sand in, it just holds the sand there. However, we need uh, recurring funds from the state budget, either matching funds or just outright funding uh, for dre a shallow draft inlet dredging, which is a big necessity right now for boats getting in and out of the inlets, as well as putting that sand on the beach. It makes no sense to dredge throw it out in the ocean and then have to bring it back later and put it on a beach and spend the money twice. So we need to you know, be very efficient uh, using the money that way and have state dredges doing that. The, um, the taxing for it can be local option uh, to some degree and our tourism dollars need to be better spent. That could be a, a source, some of our tourism dollars that come in, but we also need to market our tourism a lot better in the state as another issue. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Hamilton, I ask you, ma'am, what do you think the state's responsibility should be for beach renourishment and dredging along the shorelines, and where should the funding come from? It, the, the funding should continue to flow from the, the federal government, the, but it won't. That's, that's the problem. Um, for years, we've, we've been getting by on, on the federal government um, letting down that money because the beaches and inlets and waterways are important nationally um, as much as they are important to the citizens that, that live in this area. Um, I agree with Representative Eiler. Um, if, if we are going to take this on as a state responsibility, then, then I believe that the Corps, um, the, the Corps of Engineers should, should step aside and let us handle it as a state issue. Um, we should be able to dredge our own inlets and reuse the sand from the dredging of those inlets to, to re-nourish our beaches. It, it, in fact, is indeed a waste to throw that sand right back out into the ocean. So if we're going to do it that way and the state is going to have to pay for it, we need to change our structure of, of how we are funding these, these re-nourishments and the inlet dredging now. And those two things are not mutually exclusive. They are together and they should be treated as such. Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Harmadi, I'm going to ask you, sir, what should the state's responsibility be for beach re-nourishment and dredging on the shorelines and where should the funding come from? Well, you know, a lot of people hit on the fact that we should, uh, you know, recycle the sand and not lose po all, all part of it or all of it. Uh, another area we can look at is, is this, I mean, I'd have to study that. This is, you know, just like other areas, we have to study health care, we have to study education. I'm not for a guy that's going to jump up and give you an answer when I don't know nothing about it. But, but I'll, I'll give you some suggestions maybe. Uh, I don't think the U.S. government should relinquish their responsibility in helping the states uh, in, on this issue totally because it's a national security issue in my mind. It's also uh, uh, federal government uses some of the resources on the beaches, or the waterways, I mean. Uh, uh, we can look at other areas dealing with, uh, I think, uh, I'm not sure who brought it up about uh, the tourist uh, people coming up. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe the tourists need to get involved. Maybe the local uh, uh, people in the local community have, might have to come up with some more money. I don't know how we're going to come up with it. It's, it's something we have to study for it. And, and, and when I was auditor, uh, one of the things I had to do as an accountant auditor is study the situation, make a decision, and write a conclusion. So that's what we're doing, we're studying. Thank you, sir. Mr. Forrest. What is your uh, belief as far as the state's responsibility for beach renourishment and dredging, and where should the funding come from? Uh, well, let's start with the funding. Um, you know, I, I agree with bit, bits and pieces of what everybody said up here, but uh, you know, the federal government is broke. That's the unfortunate part of this. As Ms. Hamilton said, you know, we, we should expect it to come from the federal government. They tell us how to use our land. They tell us what we can and cannot do. The Corps of Engineers is in control of that process, and we don't have any control at the state level. So one of two things needs to happen. They need to relinquish that control and let the state handle it. In that case, it, the funding should come from the state. And the, uh, you know, I mean, this is, a, this is an issue that is both national security and it's about um, our tourism industry. Number two industry in the state is tourism. And so we need to protect our tourism industry, and we need to make sure that we're putting the investments in, in place to do that. But every year that goes by that we don't dredge, every year that goes by that we don't take care of our beaches is another uh, a year that we're spending, or potentially spending multi-hundreds of millions of dollars down the road to take care of this issue. So it's something that, uh, that we need to do, I believe, immediately as a state. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have come to the... Uh
really don't have time to have you all answer another question. I did get in an extra question more than I thought I did, but to kind of uh, make up for that, I'm going to cut your closing statements to 60 seconds. Uh, I would hope you'd be able to do that, and, uh, and as it works out, it will actually give uh, everyone a chance to uh, go first in this uh, process because we're going to start for a 60-second uh, closing statement for uh, State Senate candidate Mr. Danny Hefner. Mr. Hefner, you first for your closing statement, sir. Thank you. I would like to thank each of you for being here tonight and taking the time to actually address these issues as citizens of this district. District 8 is one of the best districts and is going to be one of the largest districts in this state uh, for, for years to come. I would like each of you to please take time to research me, to actually go to my website, dannyhefner.com, read all of the reasons that I decided to run. Also, look at the plans that I have already written. Talk to me about those plans. When you decide to call me, I am the one who answers the phone. It will not be a staff member. When you write me an email, I will be the one who answers the email. No one speaks for me except me. When I speak, I will be speaking for you. Your voices should be heard. They should be heard like rolling thunder across, it, across our beach, not like the whispers. Thank you, sir. Next for a closing statement, we will go to House 17 candidate, Mr. Frank Eiler. Mr. Eiler, you first, or you uh, next, rather, for your closing statement, sir. Thank you, John. Thank you, Bill. And thanks to the ABCPOA for putting this on tonight. Thanks, y'all, for coming. Um, one of the main things I have been doing, uh, most of you know, uh, I hold in my hand 30 or 40 press releases from the last session. Uh, the pilot prints them every week when we're in session. Unfortunately, the beacon does not. So if you get on the beacon, hopefully you'll have more information about what's going on in Raleigh by uh, printing these. Uh, it's just informational, it's not political. But also, uh, give you an example, uh, this week we had 200 emails about the uh, insurance issue, and I told them basically what I told you, what we've already done and what's being done about that. And uh, they seem to appreciate getting an immediate response back from their representative. And uh, I get individual uh, different emails. Uh, you get a, an answer back just as quickly as I can get to you. I uh, believe in communication. I uh, try to be very transparent, very open. My treasurer won a Sunshine Award for the, one of the best treasury reports in, in the legislature. And uh, I hope you get your vote and continue what we've already started. Thank you. Mr. Eiler, thank you. Next for her closing statement this evening, uh, District 18 candidate Susie Hamilton. Ms. Hamilton. Thank you, John, and thank you all for, for being here tonight. And um, I, I want to ask for your vote. I never leave a meeting without asking for your vote. Um, for those of you that are, are living in, in District 18, I'm a fighter. Um, I'm a straight shooter. I'm an honest person. And um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what I think, and I'll, I'll tell you what I believe. And I think you've seen some of that tonight. Um, I'm a family person. I fight for families, um, and I fight for the middle class. And I believe in, in our community. I'm, I'm born and raised southeastern North Carolina. I love this part of the state. I believe very much in, in what we can do. And I believe that um, together, working across party lines in the General Assembly, that, that we can make a difference for southeastern North Carolina. And I pr promise to continue to represent you well there. Ms. Hamilton, thank you. Next for a closing statement, 60 seconds, we will go to the candidate for lieutenant governor, Mr. Dan Forrest. Mr. Forrest. Thank you, John, and thank you, everybody, for your patience. I know it's getting late, a lot of, uh, a lot of answers up here, so thank you for uh, doing your duty as well as voters to listen, and listen to all these candidates. Uh, as a candidate over the last 20 months, we've been to all 100 counties, most of them many times. As I mentioned, I've traveled over 200,000 miles, met tens of thousands of people across our state. And the reason I've done that is because I believe at the executive level that uh, your leaders need to get out and know the geography of North Carolina. They need to know the people of North Carolina, but most importantly, they need to know the issues. I believe that we need a business-minded approach to government in North Carolina right now to solve the challenges that we face. And I believe that my architecture background, my small business background, uh, is effect, will be effective in that regard. As I mentioned, architects are visionaries, we're planners, we're creative problem solvers, and we're consensus builders. And those are the types of things that we need in Raleigh now to be effective moving forward into the future. And I look forward to serving you as your next lieutenant governor. And as well, I ask you for your support. Mr. Forrest, thank you. Next for a closing statement, 60 seconds, District 18 candidate, Louis Harmadi. Mr. Harmadi. 
Okay, thank you for listening. I, I hope that you'll vote for me. But I want to say, if elected, my goal would be to put North Carolina back on the economic track, uh, job creation, job growth, fiscal responsibility, energy independence, and creating a top-notch educational system. I will apply my G principle, jobs, education, energy, as my top priorities as your representative. I will fight for a balanced budget and strive to keep taxes low. I will find ways to improve estate ports, highways, infrastructure. Uh, I promise to stay informed and look at all issues and all sides of every issue, and I will make the best decision for my constituents here. Being auditor and accountant, I know how to do those things. Um, if you elect me, you will have a friend in the, in the General Assembly, and I will be, stay connected with the mayors and all my constituents. I have no special interest group supporting me, and I didn't receive any money from any special interest group. I'm funding my own campaign. Uh, I have overcome many odds in my life, including overcome, coming from Iron Curtain country uh, and facing communism and the communist tanks. Uh, I, I had a head-on injury in the military, and uh, I overcame that. I almost died. And within six months of that, I made 100% of my physical fitness test in the military. Nobody did that. Mm. Thank you, taking sir. The test. And, I'm, and I have the greatest odds in this district. So I need your vote because it's a Democratic district, and I cannot get elected with, Thank without you, your sir. vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harmadi. Next for a closing statement, uh, House 17 candidate, Lindia Washington. Ms. Washington. Well, thanks to you, uh, the audience, for listening to my ramblings today. I am very new at this, but I am a student, and I am a very good student. I've taught for many, many years. So I am willing to roll up my sleeves and go do what I need to do to get prepared to be the best state house representative for Brunswick County. I believe uh, that every person should have the right to vote. I believe that uh, every person, uh, every American uh, has the right to an education in K through 12, uh, an ex excellent education, K through 12, and uh, equal opportunity in uh, the uh, grades past that. I believe that, um, <laughs> Every American that wants a job should be able to find one. And I want to make that one of the hallmark um, uh, parts of what I do in the coming term because that is one of our lags. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you on the other side. Bye-bye. Thank you, ma'am. And for our final closing statement, before we open it up for audience questions, we go to Senate District 8 candidate, Mr. Bill Rabin. Mr. Rabin. Thank you again for this evening, Mr. Evans, Mr. Bittenbunger, and the ABCPOA. Uh, I found it very interesting as I, uh, we sat here tonight and went through these questions. Uh, every question that we were asked had already been addressed or was being or is being addressed by the last General Assembly. I found that very interesting, and, in fact, and it shows me that we are or have been a proactive General Assembly and that we are already trying to meet the needs of what you, the public, have asked. I'm proud of that. Um, as I said in my opening statement, uh, I went to Raleigh, I took with me courage, physically responsible and conservative values, and leadership. Very quickly I moved up into the ranks of leadership in the North Carolina Senate. I have one of the best voting records and have been voted as one of the most effective legislators out of the total 170 legislators. I would like to continue to do that. It will take your support for me to do it. Thank you very much, and thank you all for coming out this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank you for making those closing statements. Once again, on behalf of the audience and everybody in southeastern North Carolina, thank you for taking the time tonight to share your views on these issues and many more. But as we said, we do want to open up the floor to questions from the audience. I'm going to turn it back over to Bill for that part of our program. I know it's late, but we do have an opportunity, and you have an opportunity to direct questions to any of the candidates up on the stage, and I hope you will uh, take that opportunity. Jim, I think we'll do your uh, side. I wish that Ms. Hamilton had not left because I would have directed this question directly to her, but all the candidates may, uh, may answer. I want to know if you would support charter schools if the funding of those schools came out of the general education budget and that there was no additional cost to the taxpayers other than what would have been there for the public school system. Thank you. 
Well, I'll, I'll jump in first, and uh, if this is addressed to everybody, yes, I'm a, I am a fan of uh, charter schools to the degree that uh, we also address the uh, general public school education challenge. I think that uh, charter schools are a great idea, but I also believe they're a stopgap measure to us not solving the real challenges that face the rest of our public schools. So I'm in favor of all kinds of school choice, whether that's charter schools, uh, public magnet schools, private schools, home schools, and uh, virtual schools. Is that a okay. question for everybody? Or? Right here, we have another yeah, question. I'm, I'm also uh, sorry that Ms. Hamilton uh, had to leave or uh, whatever. But again, to, uh, I guess, Mr. Hefner, uh, you would mention it. On a voter ID, uh, everyone seemed to agree that very close to 80% of the population of the state of North Carolina favor voter ID. Both of you refer to it as a political ploy by a particular party. Uh, it, I think the Republican representatives up there would love to have 80% of the population there. How do you justify saying no to 80% of the people? If you'll remember in my response, I did not say no. I said that I personally could not support it. I also stated that if the public, if the public, now, during this last election cycle prior to May, we also had um, a social issue that was brought up that was used as a scare tactic that, uh, that, that was going to change our society forever that was put in place and fought for to be in the May primary, uh, that was Amendment 1. And that was done so to take our eyes off of everything that was going on, the loss of jobs, the concentration on the loss of jobs, and we take these social issues and we take those issues and put those to the forefront of everything that we're doing, we are tending then to fail our constituents. Those people that are sitting here now, it is my opinion in many ways that there have been failures along the way and it's because they did not take and focus specifically on the jobs. The jobs issues fall to everything in this state, it, everything, education funding, highway funding. Right now, as according to even State Senator Rouser, 444,000 jobs have been lost. Thank you, Mr. Hefner. We have time for one more question. Uh, my question is for Ms. Washington. Uh, I read in the paper that you are a neighborhood organizer, and I'd like to know what the difference is between a neighborhood organizer and a community organizer like the president? Well, I, I don't know what paper you were reading. I don't know the difference in the two. They both sound the same to me. But if I can tell you what I mean by that, then maybe it would give some clarity. I was a, a, a chairperson for the election committee to organize a town council for a city called Sun Village that was not recognized by the county because it had fallen out of, um, well, it, it's, it's Chamber of Commerce and many of its citizens had moved away and then they returned. So they had no governmental structure. So in the process of trying to do that, I organized the community, had an election, and formed a town council. Thank you very much. Uh, this is uh, getting a little bit late, and it's probably time for all of us to uh, go home. I'd like to thank you all for attending, and again, thank our co-sponsors. Thank you to our candidates for sharing your views. And a special thanks to Great job by uh, John Evans doing as our moderator. Early voting starts tomorrow, and we encourage you to vote your preference. As a reminder, each ballot has a notation that a straight party line vote still requires that you vote separately for the president and vice president, as well as the nonpartisan selection for court judges. Again, I think some of the candidates will be around for you to uh, talk to them directly. Uh, thank you very much, and good evening.